Okay, uh, so let's get started. Uh, so Mary Lou Galpier is an assistant prof at Polytechnique in uh, in France. Uh, she works on. Uh, so so I know you from uh, I guess your work in understanding neural networks with statistical physics, yeah. and you're very interested in. Uh, uh, Mary Lou is very interested in kind of applying statistical physics to neural networks um, and uh, building new ML techniques for science. Um, so today she's going to talk about uh, how to en enhance an MCMC sampling with machine learning. Uh, I really want to watch this talk, but I actually have to run and give a talk at the physics uh, ML, the ML workshop. physics workshop. <laughs> so I can't. So I'm going to watch the recording. Um, and then Natalie is going to come at the end. So your coffee break is at three, but Natalie should be there uh, before them. Um, and if anything goes wrong, uh, Christina is outside. Um, okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, so I, today we are going to talk about an aspect of machine learning, which uh, I'm sure has been covered to some extent uh, in the school before, but maybe not in depth, which is the power of machine learning to also um, model probabilistic models. So we are not anymore in the case where maybe we are doing classification or regression, but really we are trying to model distributions. So this will uh, lead us to also consider generative modeling, which is really the, the tools in machine learning that has been developed to handle those things. And then we will see how we can go back and forth between those progress in machine learning to have generative models and what are the scientific needs uh, in understanding high dimensional probabilistic models. So maybe I should start with a small survey. So who's uh, fluent to some extent with uh, Monte Carlo, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods? Okay, amazing. This is why I'm here. <laughs> and uh, who uh, is fluent in generative models? Much more, but not, no, not that much more, actually. Okay, amazing. So, so I think the talk I prepared is at the right level, hopefully. <laughs> and if you have any question at any point, do interrupt. So about the motivation, as I was saying, here we are going to be concerned with high dimensional probabilistic models. So why should we care? about high dimensional probabilistic models, well, they show up in many different aspects in science and they are those big beasts that are quite difficult to approach. So where do they uh, um, show up? So for example, in statistical mechanics or chemistry, uh, what our way of trying to understand the world is to have uh, physical systems where we have an energy functional for the, those systems. So U of X, X describing the state of the system, and by Boltzmann distribution, by Boltzmann law, we know that the statistics of the different states of the system at equilibrium will follow the following density. Uh, so it means that we have, you know, high energy uh, configurations that will be much less likely, uh, yes, than low energy configurations and so on and so forth. So really all this physics is encapsulated in this distribution. And if I can think of a, of a ex concrete example to, to give you an idea, it might be, for example, that we are doing chemistry, we are interested in um, a molecule for a reason or another, and we know that this molecule can coexist in two different shapes, two different conformations. And we want to understand what are the statistical weights of the two different conformations. So in nature, do I expect to see maybe this one much more like, much more often than this one? And, and you can think, of course, of applications in terms of drugs. Okay, I know that this protein is active as a drug when it's in this conformation. How often can I expect it to be in this conformation and to be indeed uh, useful? So that's an example. Now, if you are uh, more into quantum mechanics, of course you have uh, the states of quantum mechanics that are intrinsically probabilistic and described by their wave functions. So here again, an instance where we have i-dimensional probabilistic models showing up. And then there are also some probabilistic models that are maybe not inherently uh, given to us by nature, but some that we as scientists want to uh, 
postulate, want to uh, design because we believe that uh, they offer us a good way of uh, understanding our data. And so that's what's going on in Bayesian statistical modeling. And the idea of Bayesian statistical modeling is that you will have some data, which is what I, I just put at this big D. Uh, and to explain this data, you will have a model. And this model will have parameters. That would be this theta. And you have maybe not enough data to decide that you can really settle for one model, for one value of the parameter. So instead, you are going to look at some type of distribution of what, how likely are your different parameters given the data that you observe. And you can, OK. I'm not going necessarily to enter right now in the details of all of this, but that's the idea of why we are designing those probabilistic models on the parameters of the models that we are uh, designing as scientists to try to have an idea of uncertainty in the model we, when we fit the data. So again, a quick little example. Here, uh, it's, it's coming from astrophysics. We have the radial velocity uh, as a function of time of a star exoplanet system that we are uh, observing. So I will have a picture actually about this uh, later on if we get to the applications. But the idea is just that you have those measurements, those little black dots here and here, and you know that there is some type of periodic models that is uh, explaining those uh, uh, measurements, which corresponds to some phenomenon of an exoplanet orbiting around a star. But you have so little data that you actually know that there are um, um, periodic signals with many different uh, possible periods that are going to explain the data. And okay, having those, uh, this probabilistic view uh, allows you to know, okay, so this one is likely, but this one also is likely, how much more one is, is likely, I mean, how much likelier is one from another, and so on and so forth. So those are, are all those probabilistic models, which in most cases, we know up to a normalization constant, which means that, for example, in the Boltzmann distribution, we know the value of this energy. So we know if you want this, this, the value of this density, but we might not know the normalization constant because it's very costly to compute. Although we know <laughs> the, the value of the, of the density up to the, up to the uh, normalization constant, and, uh, and okay, so that's, that's one limitation, but you'll see that even if you know the normalization constant, those uh, objects are very hard to probe. And why? Because when uh, typically you have such a density, what you would be interested in is to compute the value of some, the expectation of some observable with respect to this density. So as I was explaining with the uh, maybe uh, molecule model, you have maybe you want to know the statistic, the relative statistical weight between two conformation. So if you want, you want the expectation of the time spent in the first conformation or the expectation of the time spent in the second conformation. So really what you want uh, in order to make sense of those uh, density rho of x of probabilities is to compute expectations. Now you cannot compute those expectations because they include uh, integrals over domains that are of very high dimension. Or actually, even if you are trying to ask your computer to compute uh, maybe an integral over five dimension, it will take quite some time, right? Because those computation scale exponentially in the dimension. So we cannot do it exactly. What's the method of choice? Monte Carlo methods. So how many people have heard about Monte Carlo? Most, right? Okay. So what's the idea behind Monte Carlo? Well, we know that there are ways where we can generate some realization of the random variable we are uh, interested. So this random variable, again, could be the state of a physical model, or it could be values of parameters of some models if we were doing Bayesian statistics modeling. And uh, such that we can approximate this expectation by an empirical average of those realizations. And so when is this equality true? Well, in particular, if X1, Xn are what we call uh, independent uh, draws from the target density, right? Now, what's the problem? Okay, I moved from the computation of the integral to uh, the sampling problem, but the sampling problem in itself 
has no simple solution per se if we are in anything larger than maybe two dimension. So the next conceptual step is to uh, actually be using Markov chain Monte Carlo, which have uh, so this the spirit of uh, working by designing a transition kernel. So this is a probability to go to x t plus one when you are coming from x t, and to design it in a way that if you propagate this uh, process for a sufficient amount of time, so start from x zero, propagate uh, uh, get x one thanks to your kernel, and then from x1 get x2 from your kernel, and so on and so forth, such that after enough time, you will actually obtain sample from the distribution you're interested in. So it doesn't seem com com um, conceptually much simpler than getting directly draws from row of x, but actually there are ways of designing uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, that are you know, straightforward that will allow you to have this property realized. Do you know of some Markov chain kernels? So, uh, oops. Yeah, okay, so actually this is, this is what uh, uh, the outline for today and what we'll start with, let me just, yeah, is one of the honor uh, in uh, Monte Carlo Markov chains, which is uh, the Metropolis Hastings sampler. So what's the idea of the Metropolis Hastings sampler? is that you are going to actually have uh, so this iteration. So this is the loop of the MCMC. And you will okay initialize in some position. And then you will have three steps if you want. The first step is to have a proposition kernel. So that's this row index P for proposal to go to XT plus one when you come from XT. And this, in theory, you have freedom to choose whatever. But it doesn't matter in a certain sense, I mean, on theory, what you take, because then you have this accept reject criteria where uh, what you're going to do is actually accept to go to xt plus one with a certain probability. And so this probability is going to uh, put into the balance two different things. Uh, both the uh, what's the density in the target? So let's say that uh, maybe I, I didn't write it down here, but now to avoid confusion, the target distribution will be denoted by rho star. So it will compare what's the uh, statistical weight in rho star of where you are trying to go compared to where you used to be, the previous iteration, but also how it was likely for you to propose this job. Because of course, if you are um, uh, proposing this job often, then you should not stay there too much uh, because you will have, have an over-representation of the state. So if you okay, propose with a kernel, accept with a probability that follows this criteria, and if in case you reject, you stay where you are, you have this metropolis Hastings sampler, which is going to converge to the target distribution uh, under a few more assumptions, but it's, it's, if you want really versatile, it's, you can apply it to anything. So it's, it's, it's really nice. Now, what's, uh, what's if, if we look at, at, at simple examples, uh, here you can look at a two-dimensional uh, probability distribution uh, that is going to have the following, if you want, contour lines. So what this picture means, right, is that here I have a high density region, here also, and here also, although they are a bit less dense. And here we have uh, regions that are really quite not likely, right, when they are darker. And this two-dimensional example that is called the Muller-Brown potential uh, is uh, usually used in, in, in chemistry to exemplify a bit uh, the problems that we are, we are going to, to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to discuss right now. So what's going to happen uh, if I start my metropolis Hastings sampler and if I use as a proposal distribution a Gaussian distribution? So here, Yes, what this says, it says that if I am in XT, I'm going to take a Gaussian that is centered at XT and that has a certain covariance. And I'm going to try to jump somewhere in this Gaussian distribution. And then I accept and I reject according to the criteria we were just uh, describing earlier. And if you do that, let's say for 100 steps, what's gonna happen? Well, most likely you are going to converge towards a high density region. Right, because your samples are uh, 
going to, I mean, they need to reflect the fact that rho star has a lot of density here. So just by the accept reject criteria, you will end up in a high density region, although you are really searching at random. So you can see that it's not really going the most direct way. Now, okay, this is really the, the Gaussian random walk, uh, maybe the most basic uh, metropolis acing sampler we can think of. Uh, but what you can also do, for example, would be to use gradient information. So you know about the U star, if you want. This is the U that corresponds to the rho star you are trying to sample. So when you think again about this rho star as being exponential minus beta U. And so what you can do is when you use as a proposal, you stay in xt, but actually you also take a gradient step towards decreasing energy. And then you draw a quotient noise around this gradient step. And so if you apply this to the same, um, the same picture, you can see that, okay, for some reason it went to another uh, region of high density, what we call a mode. But what you can uh, mostly uh, notice is that it took, you know, big steps in the, uh, when the gradients were high, and it has somehow more purpose in finding the high density region. Okay, so this one we call the metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm because it borrows from Langevin dynamics, if some of you were familiar with that. But now, what's, what can we tweet is a problem with uh, those MCMC. Does anyone of you have an idea? Well, now let's say, so same example, that I repeat this not for 100 steps, but for 10,000 steps. What has happened? Well, sure, sure, we visited very well this high density region. But if I just look at the values of X from the statistics I get from the positions I was visited by, by this walker, well, I have no idea that anything interesting is going on here with those algorithms. They have those local transitions. And in cases where there is in the target distribution, what we can call energy barriers, or uh, if you want, those are the low density regions in between high density regions, then those local algorithms need, I mean, they will eventually transition, but you will not be here to see it, right? So problem of the correlation time. And what you could argue is that, okay, but here you see the step size, which means the, the variance of the Gaussian that I'm, I'm taking around uh, the previous point to try to jump is maybe too small. So this is why I'm taking those little steps and I will never transition. Problem is that if I was to increase this step size, so this is what I'm increasing here, well, the number of acceptance I will get will just plummet. And, and why? Because it's just that I will be, you know, maybe here and then I will be shooting somewhere here. And so most of the time I will be completely out of the high density regions. And even if I'm here and I'm sampling, you know, steps, proposal steps in something like here, okay, once in a while it, it will go here, but it's going to be so, uh, you know, it's so rare that most of the time I will just get stuck where I used to be and I will just never decorrelate. So that's, that's, that's the major issue of those uh, metropolis, uh, local metropolis algorithms. And you can see that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's due to this locality and those, uh, in particular, those very uh, challenging, what we would call multimodal distributions. Okay, and of course, what I've, I've only uh, presented to you was uh, right now, some algorithms uh, that are very simple, really local, yet uh, there are many more propositions in the uh, literature that are uh, trying to, to mix faster. So, for example, there are Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which tries to uh, exploit Hamiltonian dynamics uh, to try to sample further. I mean, I'm not going to enter to the de detail uh, today, but th there's also some much more intricate methods that are actually sampling different uh, target distribution, which would be the equivalent of sampling distributions at much higher temperature and little by little decreasing the temperature because we intuit that things at higher temperature are much easier to sample than at lower temperature. So that's what we call an annealing. And so this is something you can do, but that is also computationally very heavy. And, and, and that's uh, 
So that's, I mean, sets the stage for uh, what are our motivations and what is the, the, prob the main problem we are facing. Is there any question up to now? Yes? Um, is the goal of this to uh, find like, uh, the density of uh, yeah, the, the, like the density distribution or is we turn off the computer? Yeah, so the, so the idea is that you want to find a, a, a way of obtaining samples from the distribution uh, that are uh, the closer as possible to being independently sampled from this distribution, which means that you should have, you know, many realizations here and a bit here and, and a bit more here and none maybe there in such a way that then you can compute expectations. So you can approximate integrals. That's, that's the whole game. And, and the problem is how to do that in general. Okay, yes. Uh, is the, like, what's the stopping criterion here? Like how many steps? So the, in, 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 um, the idea is that you should have a convergence criteria. You should have, well, okay, there's two things. There's how much you can afford <laughs> to run. Uh, and there's also um, uh, what are the good metrics to decide that your uh, Markov chain has converged. So I'm not going to come to, to cover too, too much of that today, uh, but you have so different things. So for example, let's say you want to compute an expectation. You can, at each iteration of your chain, you can use all the samples you've seen and compute this expectation. If the value of this expectation is still changing as you add samples, you have not converged, right? So, you know, there are easy things that you, you, should, you should look at, like this for convergence. But, but also here, you see that what I'm just telling you is tricky because if you look at the expectation you get, I mean, here you, you, your algorithm believes that there is just this big blob and it's very happy, right? So, so it's, it's um, actually a question that is really complicated and, and sampling high dimensional distribution can become arbitrarily complicated. But that's that's a really good question. So are you saying that the logic on dynamics version avoids this of going into one well as opposed to one? No, I mean that's that's, oh, I mean, that's it also does that. No, no, it also does that. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it, you're right that it's a bit confusing because in another talk uh, I had put Langevin dynamics here because I didn't had discussed it at the previous slide. But um, yeah, 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 you're right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, sorry. So now I want to flush the. Oh, but I'm just going to put the outline because I didn't put it at the right place. Up. Uh, share screen. Up. Share. Okay. So amazing. So, okay. There is a yellow box you're not seeing, but <laughs> never mind. So okay. So that's that was the you know the yes. Okay, uh, I was just wondering if you had like an estimate for the complexity of the uh, Markov chain monitor methods versus like directly computing the integral. Yes, so uh, the so computing the integral is exponential to the dimension, right? And computing uh, the Monte Carlo estimates actually doesn't depend on the dimension. So that's a that's a, a big statement because the idea is that you have a. a um, a convergence that is going to uh, uh, actually be, uh, how should I say, be driven by the number of samples you use, uh, the variance and the, the estimator is really, uh, okay, let me phrase it this way. The number of samples you need to make the estimation uh, as a function of the dimension is actually not depending on the dimension. Yet, there is a prefactor that depends on the dimension. And this is also something yet that you don't control because it depends on the problem. So it, it has to be as, uh, uh, um, faster just because you know that you don't have to have visited all positions, whereas in the integral, you would have visited all positions. But depending on problems and depending on how you engineer your Markov chain, as we are going to see, uh, those scalings can be really different. Okay, so the outline for, for the rest of the time we, uh, uh, we're going, we are going to discuss together is going to, okay, 
have a bit more, uh, have a, a couple, see a couple of more methods uh, to tackle those problem of, of estimation in high dimension with probabilistic models. Uh, so after the Metropolis Hastings MCMC, and that's going to be variational inference and important sampling. And once we will have this, we will go to these deep generative models and unsupervised learning, reviewing rapidly uh, what they are and what they can do. And finally, combining it all to try to have faster ways of uh, precisely computing, ex um, estimating those expectations. Okay? So I had already covered the Metropolis Hastings. So let me go to the variational inference. So who has already heard about variational inference? Okay, amazing. So what's, what's variational inference? Well, in this case, you're not really thinking about sampling anymore. What you're gonna do is um, optimize a surrogate model to approach your target distribution. So let's say that your target distribution is this row star, what you're going, and that you have a parameterized distribution, rho theta, uh, that you are going to adjust to match as closely as possible your target distribution. Well, the way you typically do that is by using this cool back label divergence, which is a measure of how different two distributions are. And uh, in particular, this is always going to be positive and it's going to be zero if and only if rho theta is equal to rho star. So you can see that it's a good, in a sense, training objective for your surrogate model rho theta. And uh, you can actually evaluate it because it's, so it's an integral over rho theta of the log of the ratio between the two densities. But you see that uh, this log, the expectation of this ratio can be approximated by a Monte Carlo method just by drawing from rho theta. And this is what you assume you can do easily. So that's, that's the, the way people uh, do rational inference. And uh, for example, let's say uh, that you, uh, what are the examples of, of simple rho theta that you can use? So distribution that you will be able to write down the value of uh, the density and to sample easily. Well, some, some things that is ubiquitous is to use a uh, Gaussian approximation, right? So it would be a model with two parameters. Uh, well, if it's in, in the dimension, then you will have a vector and a matrix parameter for the mean and for the covariance, right? Now, if we think, oh no, there is no the, okay, I'm missing a plot, but if we go back to, oh, here it is. So if we think about this distribution we were just uh, mentioning, and if we think about the best Gaussian approximation to it, what do you think? So we have something that is a bit like this, right? Oops, that doesn't work. Yeah, there's some black. That's better. Yeah, so we have something that is a bit like this. And what's the shape of a motion? Yeah, it's, it's gonna be an ellipse, right? So, it's not even clear what it would be the best approximation. Maybe it will just actually catch one mode because this one has the has most density. So maybe it will just have a rho theta that is like this, or maybe it will try to do, you know, a big Gaussian like this. But quite clearly, uh, you have an issue when you are doing this variational inter which you are, if you want trusting your rho theta to make all the operations you didn't know how to do on your rho star, uh, is that you have an, an an issue of expressiveness of, or expressivity of the surrogate model. And you have to have an idea of how to control the quality, which you can do difficult, difficultly, because here actually, you, if you don't know the normalization of this row star, in the end, you don't know where is the zero, you have a constant, you know, this, this, um, this loss function uh, up to a constant. And so it's not so clear uh, how to control the quality. Because here it's in 2D, so you can check. But in 2D, you can do what, whatever you want. But we are thinking about, you know, maybe uh, 100 atoms molecules or uh, 10 parameters models or, or things like this, so in higher dimension. Okay, so that's, that's still something that has been really useful in many contexts, but you can see that it has those caveats. Uh, 
the, th the third thing I wanted to mention here is important sampling. So does that ring a bell? To some, yes, okay, to many. So just the quick reminder of, of important sampling is that here we are going to have what we call a proposal distribution, uh, row P, that we can easily sample from. And then that we are going to sample, to use the samples from this distribution to compute weights that we are going to um, insert in our estimation of the expectations and what are the values of those weights. Well, they are just precisely comparing what was the actual statistical weights of the sample XI in the target density compared to what it was when we have drawn it in the proposal density. And we have this that we renormalize by all the samples we've seen to get rid of the normalization constant we don't know. And by just this simple computation of those weights that we put in the estimation of the expectation of some function f we are interested in, we can do, a, a, I mean, have an estimate of expectation with respect to actually rho star. Now, let's consider the, the a one dimensional case in which maybe we have the target density that is this uh, blue curve. So of course this is easy, but imagine uh, just the case we would like to do it with important sampling. And imagine that the uh, row P density is this red curve. So what's gonna happen is that we are going to have samples all the way here. And then when we are going to reweight them, the samples that were here and here are going to have weights going to zero because in the target density, they don't really have density when they were here and when they were here. And so we are going to just reweight things that are really in the core and things are gonna work pretty fine. Now imagine we were doing it the other way around. Imagine that I propose with the blue density and that I am actually looking at, uh, I mean, looking, uh, searching for uh, an expectation with respect to the red density. What's gonna happen? So I propose with the blue, while what I'm actually looking for is the row stars that corresponds to the red. So the same, yeah? You won't see like the tails, right? Yeah, you won't see the tails, right? Because here, the blue is going to give you samples that are here, but none here and none here. Or you would need to draw a massive amount of samples to start seeing you know, the very, very unlikely uh, places that are here. And so also, if you would have a sample here, the weight will be big because the, the reweighting will realize that this place is unlikely in the proposal, but likely in the targets. Well, if you do it this way, you probably will never see samples here. And so you will never have this power of approximation. So this is, you, you see the, just a picture in one dimension to give you the intuition, but of course this, is worse and worse as you increase dimensions. And uh, if you want, this is the issue of correspondence between the target distribution and the proposal that we have in this important sampling, right? We need to have precisely the important, the, pro, the sorry, the density proposal that is a bit wider than the, what the density we are actually after. But this can become really stringent in high dimension because if you are a lot wider, it also means that you will draw all those samples that will have just zero weight and that you will not <laughs> be using at all. And so you will be using a uh, losing a lot of computation power at taking care of those samples that are actually not, not at all uh, representative of your target distribution. So you have a, a, a problem of this correspondence. Yes. Practice how you determine a proposal. It seems like at least you need to know the mean. Of the yeah, exactly. So, so important sampling works out of the box, if you want, in low dimensions, because you can postulate something that is very flat and you will, you will manage. But in high dimension, important sampling only works if it's adaptive, meaning that it's going to indeed try to look at samples and uh, adapt the proposal to it. But we'll come back to adaptive methods. Okay. Okay, so that, that was the, the, the different uh, uh, you know, inference and sampling methods I wanted to flash. Now let's put them in, in, in face of what we can do now with generative modeling and unsupervised learning. So 
I don't know how much you are familiar with them, but I would phrase uh, the paradigm of, deep, of latent deep generative models as the following. So how do they work? They are those probabilistic models that start with a latent variable that I'm calling Z, and that is a random variable drawn from a simple distribution that I'm going to index by B because I think of it as the base distribution. So I have this Z that comes from a simple base distribution, think maybe a multivariate Gaussian, that is then going to be transformed with a, a, so a parameterized transformation that I'm calling T theta. So again, theta always standing for the parameters. And uh, in a way that's then when I transform, uh, then I obtain this X that comes from this T theta of Z, I obtain uh, samples from a distribution I'm interested in. So typically this T theta is parameterized by neural networks in many different ways. Um, and typically what we do is that we adjust the value of the parameters of the transformation such that uh, what we get as X's through this process is going to imitate what we have seen in training data. And for example, it's widely used in image models. And here, the, the deep generative model I'm mentioning is uh, using, so it's transforming Gaussian noise in images of dogs. Okay. And we can see them as probabilistic models parameterizing some type of rho theta of X that is highly flexible, right? So uh, we can do things that are really efficient, right? And in particular, what you can notice is that uh, they are able to, okay, no, this is not something I, <laughs> I was going to say now. Okay, I'll come back to it. Um, do you know about, yes? Uh, how much control do you, do you have over the kinds of images that are produced in this way? Um, what do you mean by, by control? Like, um, like, let's say I wanted a picture of a dog, like, but I would have to pass through some Gaussian noise to get it, but I don't know how I would actually get the dog out. So, so it depends on, on what uh, you train the model with. So let's say you train the model on a data set of different pictures of dogs. If it's well trained and people can do amazing things, then each time you draw a new uh, random Gaussian noise, you get a new image of a dog. It will be different each time. Um, I think there are some cases where they manage to reverse engineer uh, the models to, for example, control for color or control for things. But just in this in this simple version, it's just you get a new noise, you get a new dog, and you don't have control to which dog you're going to get. And if you had trained it on a data set that has many different categories, then you would not really have uh, control on which category you get. Okay. Unless you engineer the thing more. Yeah. Okay, so do you know, train, I mean, have you heard about deep generative models and different ways of training them? Yes, so if I tell you that there's two main paradigms, the first one would be to do maximum likelihood. So what's maximum likelihood is to say, okay, I have my training data, those are those XIs. What I'm trying to maximize is the probability of observing uh, the, the training data. And okay, I take the sum of the log of this probability for each of the, the data, the data points. So that's the maximum likelihood um, framework, which is ubiquitous in unsupervised learning uh, to learn probabilistic models precisely. So that's one paradigm. And the second paradigm, oh, and of course, when you have the loss, then you just do SGD <laughs> to find the value of the parameters, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and then the second paradigm is adversarial training. So everybody has heard about adversarial training. So you have both this generator, which is my T theta, and this discriminator, D of phi, and you have this, uh, what we call a mean max gain, where uh, the generator is trying to fool the, gener the discriminator. The discriminator is trying to recognize whether a training data point was generated by the generator or comes directly from the training data. So it's trying to, you know, fight against the generator that is trying to 
generate data that looks as well as as closely as possible as the training. And the discriminator is like, okay, you don't fool me. <laughs> I know what's from the training data and I'm, I know what's from you. Uh, and you have this min-max game that's historically led to the first uh, really impressive generations, for example, of images. Uh, so that was back in 2016, uh, 2017, that uh, this DC GAN could generate images of faces that were really convincing through this paradigm. Okay, now concerning this maximum likelihood, which is maybe less more common in the general uh, literature uh, in machine learning and not in deep learning in particular, there is a caveat with many of these deep generative models. Do you have an idea? So if I tell you variational encoder, do you know about them? No? Okay, so the variational encoder, uh, which I'm not going to review into the detail, but he's trying to go around this problem. What is this problem? The problem is that I can not actually compute the likelihood of those models in general. So again, you have this, this process that defines this rho theta. And if you were to, you, to compute the value of this rho theta, actually what you would have to do is to compute a high dimensional integral. So why is that? It's because what you know about this rho theta is that you sampled something from rho b and then you passed it through t theta. And so it means that it corresponds to the volume or the density, if you want, of all the z's according to rho b, which matches the, transform, the x and the transformation with t theta. So with this delta function that is only uh, um, going to contribute to the integral if those two are equal. So in the end, the, the way those things are uh, uh, defined uh, actually doesn't give you a, an explicit formula for this rho theta. You will need to compute an integral, which is, you know, we are back to the original problem of com uh, computing high dimensional integrals, which is not at all simple. So this is why uh, actually there is what we call variational and encoders, which are constructing variational approximation within the training. So, okay, this starts to become intri intricate, but, but that's, that's uh, what this is about. And this is the motivation for introducing a, a new type of deep generative model you may or may not have heard of, which are normalizing flows. So does normalizing flows ring a bell? Nope. Okay, so there are this specific type of deep generative models which are working exactly in the same way as I was describing, except that they impose a constraint, which is that T theta has to be an invertible map. So it means that, for example, if I'm looking at uh, generating some images that correspond to a certain dimensionality, now I need to, com to consider a uh, base distribution, latent variables that have the same dimensionality, and I need to parameterize this one-to-one -one mapping between the latent space and the output space. So, okay, uh, and if we have this T theta that is invertible, then we can compute exactly this rho theta. And that comes from what's called in the, in the probability literature, the change of variable formula, where you just, okay, if you want to make the counts of who is in the latent space will contribute to X. So you have to look at what was actually the, the the, I don't know how to say that in English, <laughs> what, what, gener what could have generated X. So you just take the inverse of H of X uh, through the transformation and you put that in the base distribution. And there is also a term that comes from the Jacobian of the transformation. I mean, no, no worries. You don't need to understand that into the details if that doesn't talk to you, but just what you need to, to have understood is that thanks to imposing the fact that the, the map has to be invertible, then you can actually compute the value of the push forward. And you'll see that this is what's super valuable in this business of using uh, Monte uh, generative models for Monte Carlo methods. So, okay. You watch the latent space. It's not the noisy, the Gaussian noisy, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. You can still have a latent space that is a Gaussian noise, 
and you can still transform it with an invertible transformation in the image of a dog. Why do I want to recover a Gaussian you don't want You don't necessarily want to recover a Gaussian noise, but you want to be able to evaluate that. And you'll see why in a second, okay? But okay, um, maybe just to give you an idea of how we can parameterize neural networks to be invertible, because if you think about it uh, uh, rapidly, you will see that a typical uh, fully connected layer is not invertible, a typical convolutional layer is not invertible. So how do we have expressive transformation that are invertible? Well, there's zillions of tricks uh, as a, the, the, I mean, I think the number of tricks scales as the, uh, as, as the um, size of the community. And so in machine learning, <laughs> you always get a lot of them. Uh, a lot of people are really good ideas, but the one I, I, in a sense, I prefer because it's super easy, actually really expressive. Um, so, so really neat is the one of coupling layers. So what's a coupling layer? A coupling layer works as follows. So here you should think of X as being the input of my layer and Y being the output of my layer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition the vector X of input in two things, something that I call X1 and something that I call X2. So you just imagine you have a D-dimensional vector. You take the D over two first coordinates and the two D over two second coordinates and you call them X1 and X2. Okay, and that what you're going to do is you don't change X2. You just send it to uh, the, the next layer and change. Y2 is equal to X2. But then what you do with uh, X1 is that you have some invertible transformation. And here, actually, you can even do it with something very simple, like an affine transformation of X1, for which, actually, you computed the scaling uh, trans uh, the, the, the scaling of the affine transform and the translation in the affine transform as a function of X2. So here, let's say that I have a X1 that is of dimension D over 2. I have here a fully connected neural network that takes as inputs a D over 2 uh, vector and that outputs a D over 2 vector that I will multiply element-wise to X1. And here I have a transform that is also going to output me one scalar per dimension. And you see that if I do that, I can very easily inverse the layer because I know that Y2 is equal to X2. So I can reuse uh, my parameterized transformation, so typically with neural networks, to recompute the scaling and the translation and just to inverse the transformation I did on, on X1. So with this coupling layer, which seemingly looks linear, but it's not because it's linear, yes, in X2, but it's not linear in X1 because it mixed, it multiplied things that uh, took as input X2 and to X1. You can get things that are very expressive. And of course, uh, you will compose those layers, right? So you will have first you change X1, and then on the next layer, you're gonna change X2 and so on and so forth to get something that is pretty uh, expressive. And you can also notice that if you were to compute the Jacobian, so which are the, the coordinate wise uh, derivative of the map that you need uh, in uh, the change of variable formula, this is also a layer that is very easy in terms of computing this quantity. So normalizing flows are easy to sample and easy to evaluate densities. And if I just, again, uh, fix the ideas, by composing those different layers that seemingly are by themselves not doing much, we are going to be able to transform deeply distributions that we are interested in. So for example, if you take uh, here this two-dimensional problem where I start from a Gaussian distribution in two dimension, and I just call out the points according to their coordinates on, on one of the axes, just so that I can see where they are going to be moved by the uh, network as I compose the different layers. And I show you where the different points are going after different layers. If my target was this distribution that as the shape of a cross, as the density, you can see that little by little, this is going to get you closer and closer 
to something that becomes more and more complicated. So, of course, this is still very simple, but trust me that you can do things that are really elaborate with those networks. You, you could have nonlinearities that are invertible, that wouldn't break the principle. Uh, but I, I haven't even been needing to use them. Because, I mean, just the fact that here you have nonlinearities is enough. Okay? Question? No. Okay. So now that we have those uh, big deep generative models, and that seemingly each time I generate a new Gaussian noise, I can get a new sample from a complicated distribution, such as a distribution that would generate dogs. Uh, what I'm asking myself is, can I use them? Can I use them as surrogate models to do sampling in high dimension, right? Because they are probabilistic. They sample very efficiently complex distribution. How do I make that bridge to obtaining the samples of this row star that I may be interested in because it comes from my physics model or it comes from my Bayesian statistical model? Well, two things that should come to mind right up front is the fact that, well, don't you need data in order to train deep generative models? So if I wanted to have a generative model such that the row theta is close to the row star, well, I would need samples, data. The training data would be samples from the targets. That's what I'm after. So how do I break this conundrum? And second, even if I moderately successful at like getting uh, uh, a generative model to train towards rho, C, rho star, it's unlikely to be perfect, right? It's unlikely that I have rho theta that is going to be exactly equal to rho star. But as scientists, we care. We care about the fact that we are actually sampling from the distribution that we are after, right? It's a bit different from trying to sample images of dogs and being happy if more or less they look like images of dogs. We want to sample from the target distribution. So how do we leverage learning while knowing that we have no guarantees about how well it can learn? So that's uh, time to come to the third part of the talk that is really going to put everything into places by combining uh, so tradi traditional uh, inference methods and learning. Any questions? Nope. Okay. So first, we'll go back to variational inference and sampling. Then we'll talk about the opportunity of using normalizing flows as reparameterization map, additive algorithm, which uh, we'll see how well we are doing on time, but this is where I've been working myself recently. So probably I, I'll spend too much time here. Uh, and finally, I mean, making just one, oops, there is a problem of numerotation, but that's not just about this one last comment I wanna make uh, about incorporating more physics in the models and in the generative models. Okay, so uh, the first idea that people had when they developed normalizing flows, uh, so, and this was, this idea was exported in 2015, is to do variational inference with a normalizing flow. So, now I have still this, this same uh, you know, objective that I want to minimize uh, this callback library that divergence between the target and the model, which I can efficiently uh, estimate thanks to the flow, which is easy to sample. It's one of these deep generative models where you can just sample Gaussian noise and push it through the transformation that's even cheap in your computer. Uh, now, with the flows, you have also uh, solved the problem of, okay, do I have an explicit expression for this Rosita? Yes, you have, thanks to the change of variable formula. And of course, uh, now you have something that is much more flexible. So what are, uh, that the, for example, the Gaussian example I was describing to you uh, at the beginning with the normalizing flows. So in 2015, this is, for example, the first example, the first, uh, uh, little time models they were looking at. So they have these two dimensional densities that are their targets. So this is their row stars. And they made those, those little plots that I like because it really exemplifies the problem of the expressivity. So here between the different columns, you have more and more layers in the normalizing flow. 
which means that the layer, the, the, your ansatz, your, your parametric model is more and more expressive. And you can see that the result of the variational inference, so the rho theta that they get, is going to become better and better in the sense that it's closer and closer to the target as you add more and more flexibility to your model, right? So that was back in 2015. Uh, now in 2019, uh, the team of Panzang run this paper, wrote this paper that was called Solving Statistical Mechanics Using Variational Autoregressive Networks. And what some, so, I mean, I would say that the key problem in statistical mechanics is computing free energies. And this is precisely what they did, computing free energies, which, co which corresponds to the normalization constant of uh, the Boltzmann distribution. And they did that, so for a spin system that had uh, 20 spins, so the dimension starts to scale up, right? This was two dimensional. Now we are looking at, uh, at a system that has 20 dimension. And uh, okay, and they compute this free energy as a function of the temperature. So, okay, the shape is not so, so important, but what they did was compare it with different uh, ansatz, different parametric models. So naive mean field being something really crude and then, you know, up to using the, the normalizing flow, which are those red dots. And with the normalizing flow, they could get something that perfectly matched the exact free energy that in the models they chose, they were able to compute. So that was, that was pretty exciting. There was one caveat, which is that they required annealing of the target distribution. So what this meant is that actually they were not directly after their targets. What they had to do is engineer the scheme that first they will fit the equivalent of the target density at higher temperature and little by little decrease the temperature. So there was more tricks going on. So Again, why? And, and, and it boils back also to the problem of how do you control the quality of the surrogate model uh, that you train? And, and to, to I mean, show you what can go wrong uh, and why in that case they need the alleling, let me show you this really simple example in two dimension again, where the target would be this mixture of Gaussian, which has two modes, right? Two components in the mixture of Gaussian, uh, one of them is twice as likely as the other one. Okay, but that's something uh, you would like to sample from. Now let's imagine that you run the variational inference as uh, we have uh, stated it. We saw, okay, these targets. And here in blue, what I'm plotting is the value of this row theta. So I'm going to launch the animation, but right now it's just at the beginning of the learning where it, it doesn't know anything about the target. The, the initialization was random and okay, it's here. And what's gonna happen in this case, if I launch the movie is the following. Again, what's happening is that I'm just plotting what's going on to rho theta of t if I'm running a gradient descent on this objective function to try to have rho theta come closer to rho star. So what has happened? Yeah, so it flew to one mode. It even like concentrated all the mass of Rosita at the center of one mode. It has no way of knowing that something else is happening somewhere else in the space because it gets all its information from where the model has data. So that's, uh, if, if I manage to relaunch the animation, that's what I was figuring out with those little dots that correspond to the sample you are getting in order to evaluate your loss. They don't explore at all the whole space. They only explore where there is some blue. And so it's just going to flow towards the closest mode and cannot do anything better. So that's what we call mode collapse. Uh, and that's a problem of this objective uh, when doing variational inference. And here, there's the problem also that, that you will not know, right? Your loss will, will, will decrease and you will be very happy. But if you have no idea then that something else exists somewhere you will never know and that's a fundamental problem about finding modes in high dimension which okay <laughs> is we know can be arbitrarily difficult okay so that that was a first a first idea of how to use this new technology in order to um, accelerate inference 
the next idea was to use it for important sampling. And here in this paper that uh, made a lot of noise, that was called the Boltzmann Generator by the team of Frank Noe, and that appeared in Science in 2019, they actually uh, used maybe two, two things. Uh, okay, they made two innovation, if you want, compared to the variational approach I was just showing you. First, in the training scheme. So what they did is that, okay, they did use uh, the same variational inference loss. So that's exactly what we were discussing. But they also added some data. They assumed that they had some initial data, so some initial samples that were representative of the distribution. They were trying to sample further. And so they could add a maximum likelihood term in their loss. So they combined the variational inference with something that you would do if you had a training set making the assumption. And in their case, they were looking at molecules, so their data were coming from molecular dynamic simulations. So they did that, and what they also did was to phrase it as important sampling. So with important sampling, what you can do is again, sample from the flow, and then correct for what the flow has learned by reweighting according to the target distribution, which again, you know. So you're able to compute this reweighting and plug those uh, weighted samples in the expectation of any function you want to estimate. And so doing this, they were relatively successful. And in particular, they were uh, able to look at proteins with uh, 58 amino acids. So, you know, dimension are starting to, to scale up and up. Uh, Again, by having this combination of a surrogate model, that this is the picture of a normalizing flow that generates from a Gaussian and then generates some molecules, and then having this control with the reweighting. So in particular, if your model is completely off, you will see it because all your weights, uh, I mean, all those ratios here would look really tiny, or you will have a high variance of those weights. Yes? So here we are, we are being, you know, somehow vague because we use this F as the function we want to estimate. But for example, if you, if you, I mean, F could be the identity and then you look at the mean of the distribution or it could be a square and it's a bias or it could be the energy functional and you're looking for the mean energy. It could be whatever, okay. right? Okay, so another problem that was in this, in, in this paper, and I mean, I'm, I'm saying a problem, but another thing you should notice because it's still a very impressive paper that, that managed to do a lot, uh, is the fact that there was this chicken and egg problem between the fact that you need data in order to train your model that you want to train to obtain data. So there is this, this loop of, okay, you need to, if you want, nucleate the, uh, this, the process with data in order to get the model to get data. So sure, and, and in a sense, it's not clear from this formulation how much data you need. So the next, uh, so okay, I will, I will come back to this. Uh, and so right now we've seen how to use normalizing flows for variational inference and important sampling. Now comes uh, what I started to tell you about uh, was, was the Monte Carlo methods and Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So one of the first things that was um, exploded in, uh, with the normalizing flow in the MCMC was the following observation. The observation that again I had this you know this this little uh, picture that I was just showing you that you are able to map a Gaussian distribution to the output distribution that you like, and since the transformation is invertible, it also means that the you can map the distribution you'd like to a Gaussian distribution, and the fact that you can have this what we can call a reparameterization re trick makes it that you, instead of thinking of sampling the distribution that may have a complex ge geometry, you can try to transport your problem in the latent space and sample something that should be close to a Gaussian 
once your transformation is learned. So here, uh, it was, so I think these two papers investigated this. So it was Boltzmann generated paper I just mentioned, but also the paper by uh, Matt Hoffman and, and collaborators that was called Neutralizing Bad Geometry, with a pun on the fact that they were using neural networks uh, to make this uh, reparameterization. And here, this plot from, from the Frank Noe paper shows if we were reconsidering this model potential in 2D, and if we are coloring samples that would be in this blob in blue, in this blob in orange, and in this blob in red, if we transport them back to the latent space, so applying, if you want, T theta minus one, where they lie. So here, the latent space uh, has the base distribution of a Gaussian. So they were mapping the Gaussian samples towards samples that would lie here. So if you take samples that would lie here and map it back to the latent space, you get something that is approximately Gaussian. And you can see that the samples that were in different modes somehow far away and separated here looks like they're close to one another. And so that you can exploit this reparameterization to actually think about doing the MCMC in the latent space. So, yes. Excellent question. So in the, in the, in the next, uh, uh, okay. So in the next method I'm going to show you, uh, we are actually going to directly sample from the Gaussian. Now there is reason to believe that because of scaling problems that I will hopefully tell you about at the very end, doing something that is still local would make sense in the Latin space. I'll, I'll, Yes. So let's, uh, okay, it, it only learns it up to something, right? And that's the problem that you have this, this gap between what the, learn, 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 uh, what the normalizing flow can learn uh, and what's the actual distribution uh, that, that is going to become harder and harder to fill this gap as the dimension grows. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm also very happy to, to discuss that uh, in more detail offline. But yes, the, the, you're totally right. So, but let me show you the next, the next part because I think it's, it's really informative. So here, uh, still on this idea of using what you've learned, the flow that you've learned for reparameterization, um, I just wanna, uh, you know, place back the idea that if you had, again, a multimodal Gaussian targets, and if you were to do something that was purely local, then, you know, a worker that was initialized in any of the, the modes would explore very well any of the modes, but there wouldn't be any mixing in between the modes. And in particular, here in this case, where there's one mode that is twice as likely as the other one, the data that you would look at, I mean, from these two workers is not showing you that at all. You have visited the two modes with an equal number of times, and and you cannot make sense of this. Here, where well, you are using instead uh, the transported uh, local algorithm. So here, what you have is, okay, it's not exactly the same target distribution, but the target distribution is a, is a Gaussian with four modes. And here, what I'm showing you are the chains, one chain, actually, one MCMC chain that comes from running this uh, actually local algorithm in the latent space. And here, what I'm showing you in the latent space is the transport of these four modes by the T minus one transformation. And so what you can see is that the flow was trained to train a Gaussian unimodal to those four different modes. So if I just take those four different modes and I put them back, okay, this is not exactly a Gaussian at all, but you can see that it concentrated the mass in one place. And so the local algorithm here that is going on this weird landscape, but that course, but that is more compact, if you want, than uh, the direct uh, distribution is going to be able to transition between the different regions. And you will, if you just transport back the chain in the direct space, what you will see is a mixing between the different modes. Okay, so the idea is just that we had those blue blobs as a target, we had learned a flow to map a Gaussian to those blue blobs. So then we can take the inverse of the flow to map the blue blobs to the latent space 
and run some MCMC that is local, but that is going to benefit from the reparameterization of the space um, in order uh, to generate transition in between the modes. Okay, so that's uh, a reparameter reparameterization trick. And anytime that you are trying to sample something that is not even necessarily multimodal, but something that, for example, would be very elongated in one direction and not in another one, just rescaling things can be really helpful. And that's what's been exploded. Okay. Now, uh, false idea is to do things in direct space and it goes back precisely to what you, you were saying that you could directly sample from the flow uh, independently. Uh, and that's doing ad adaptive MCMC. And that's something I've been working on. So what the idea of an adaptive MCMC uh, is that you are going to adjust the way you do your MCMC along the MCMC using the value of the states you've been visiting. So in this, uh, instance in goes this way, that you have your MCMC loop with the Metropolis Hastings algorithm we started with, which again has, in this, in this the, the, the small difference here is that you need to think about it as having multiple walkers walking in parallel, so having multiple MCMC chains propagating in parallel. And then what's happening? Well, that you have, okay, the Metropolis Hastings steps, which uses as a proposal, a normalizing flow. And this normalizing flow, which is a proposal that is no longer local in the sense that it doesn't depend on XT. You go, you propose XT plus one completely independently of XT. And then you have your usual, you know, computation of uh, the acceptance ratio that is supposed to correct for how different is the proposal compared to your target distribution rule star? So you do that. And as you do that, things are supposed to get better and better. You are going, you're supposed to get samples that will look more and more like samples uh, from row star. And okay, and maybe you can do some local resampling that I will probably briefly mention. But importantly, what you also do is that you use the value of the XT, so the value of all the states that you uh, visits in order to do some maximum likelihood training on uh, the normalizing flow. So what you are using is the fact that the samples are going to converge to samples of Rostar and use them in order to increment the values of the parameters of the normalizing flows so that it approaches the values of Rostar. Yes. How does this um, yeah, the so that's precisely not what is going to happen here because the proposal that we are going to use is not local anymore so you are going you're somewhere in some mode but if your flow has learned mass on different modes it will propose randomly in different modes but, okay so you begin with some flow that is that starts as something that is pretty really global. So let's let's look at let's, let's look at, at this example. So this was just the same target local methods that I was just showing you. Now, and I will take your question maybe after the right. So now what this is what this algorithm would do. So I have a flow that has the same initialization as I was showing you before, it doesn't know about the targets, but but I have workers in each of the modes that are at, at initialization. And so the walkers are going to start walking and as they walk, they generate data and this data drives the learning of my flow towards the regions, when there is, where is there is data, where there is data. And little by little, the flow is really going to learn what's the target distribution and is going to be able to propose samples in a location in two modes completely independently. So you will have really the change going back and forth. And importantly, you will see that, okay, the second mode that was twice as likely will indeed be twice, I mean, um, will indeed have a weight that corresponds to twice the weight of the other one. So here in particular in the normalizing flow, but most importantly, in the samples that you are going to collect because they are corrected by this metropolis Hastings step. 
So even if the flow was not perfect, the metropolis hasting step is correcting for it, but the fact that the flow is really good makes it really fast to equilibrate the MCMC trade. Question? Yeah, this is really cool. So um, I was wondering why you, so the flow you can also train directly on the energy, right? Uh, but That's you don't seem to do that here? Because you have mode collapse. Okay, but you cannot, I see. That's, that's the reason why. And, and you see, and this is why the other paper was using a bit of variational inference, which is training on the energy and some data. And here you are a bit, if you want, and here you could add the variational inference loss, but I, I think really the maximum likelihood loss, which you can access thanks to the fact that you are thinking about it adaptively, that you are using the MCMC samples to train yourself, uh, is I think the most uh, important in making this successful. Do you know about the stochastic normalized post metric? Yes. Do you know how that compares to this? So you, you're saying the one from uh, Frank Norris group. Yeah. So the problem of the, oh, I'm maybe being too vocal, but something that is a bit hidden, I would say, in this paper is the fact that they cannot compute exactly this flow theta anymore because they are putting some MCMC steps in between the layers. So they argue that you can do some Monte Carlo to estimate the rho theta, but you know, you are starting to incorporate more and more approximations. So I think it depends on the use case. Okay. You're welcome. Um, and to say, it, I think that that goes back to your question of, well, how will the model know about the different modes? Well, it's because you pose it as a, a requirement that you initialize workers in different locations that you know are of interest. And because if, if not, then you will never learn about them. Just to make sure, if you don't, the first animation, then you put them actually in most of the class. I'm guessing that in most practical um, applications, you won't actually know where the modes are, even points that you think are, are special might not actually be like take the whole space into account. So you want to Okay, so there's there's two different things. There's the fact that here you're not actually sensible exactly where it is, but it has to be somewhere of interest within some of the regions you want to prop. But then, and then that's realistic. For example, if you think about this molecular problem I was telling you about, you have those two molecules, you know them, but what you don't know is what's the relative statistical weights of the different conformation, because maybe you know one has a much higher energy as the other one. But maybe it has a much more basin you can explore around it. And so its free energy is going to be much higher than the other one that has a lower energy. So that's the type of questions you want to answer to. And, and then if you don't know, and I mean, if you take just an arbitrary distribution in an arbitrary dimension, then we know it's NP hard to find local minimum, which means that it's just proven <laughs> that it's a priori exponentially difficult. So here there is, if you want no more discovery and we don't claim that we are discovering mode. What we claim is that if you have some vague knowledge of where you are interested in, you'll be fine. And this can actually be used with any uh, proposal distribution like sample, not just proposal. Yeah, 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 you can, you can, you can any proposal based MCMC can take advantage of this. Okay, um, what was next? Yeah, it was just a picture again of uh, saying that you have those chains that are propagating and you are using the data from time to time of those chains to train the model that you are using in your no non-local sampler. And that's just rephrasing the idea of, of the algorithm. And okay, and so I, I've been working on that. So blending in normalizing flows, but this adaptive MCMC is not at all something new. It's been, you know, people have been thinking about it for decades now. It started with, okay, I'll do a Gaussian random walk and I'll adjust the covariance of my proposal to the data I've, I've been visiting. And now we have those new, you know, fancy versions where we incorporate generative models in the adaptive uh, methods. But it also has a taste of local plus mode jumping methods where you think about this, uh, something that will allow you to explore a mode and something that will allow you to jump uh, out of a mode. 
And regarding this, maybe something I haven't been insisting on is the fact that I'm also using a local sampler. So I'm taking steps of the non-local sampler with normalizing flow, but also steps with the local sampler. Any guess why? Sorry, you have to yeah, yeah, it's it's good for the stuff, but even it's good all the time because what you can be pretty sure about is that your normalizing flow is going to be really bad in the tails of the distribution. So the tail of the distribution is something that statistically you will see very rarely. And so your learning is very likely to be very poor. And here I just made up this, this little example. Okay, so I'm sorry, the projector is not perfect, but okay, the idea is that I have those two wiggles. Okay, it's, it's an arbitrary choice, right? But imagine this is your target distribution. And imagine that uh, you have a normalizing flow with a small representative power and all that it managed to learn from it was those two blobs. So it has this, this, this proposal distribution with those two blobs. And if you want, it's, a, it's just a toy model for the case where we are in very high dimension. We are thinking of very complicated distribution and the flow will have learned something useful, but it will be missing on something. So here it will be missing the fact that there are some tails here that are coming out of the blob where it's proposing. And if you are using, sorry, if you are using only the global method, then what it's going to do is, okay, it's going back and forth from the modes. It's exploring well the realm in which it's proposing, but it's not at all going outside. Or when it's going outside, it's getting stuck. So here, the size of the dots corresponds to the number of consecutive rejection you got in the Metropolis A thing. And here, when it's the global only, what it's going to do is say, okay, oh, wait, there's mass here. My proposal distribution is as very low mass here. I should stay for a while and not jump out. But it means that you will just stay in one point. And so the variance, I mean, your exploration is pretty bad. Compared to what's going on, if you're adding some local steps, is that okay? The, met the global metropolis easting is not going to jump back because it's not favorable. It, it realizes that the, it's unlikely it will propose there, so it will stay there. But the local algorithm is going to make the job at looking around. Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, the idea is to interleave them. Maybe you take 10 steps of the local, one step of the global. It depends on how much uh, both of them cost you, right? So, but it is interleaving. I mean, it's not yeah. something like every step would be something that takes into account for. Certain... No, I mean, you can actually, it, you have pretty much freedom in phrasing how you, you want to do it. Uh, yeah, but I think the simplest way is really interleaving. Yes. So, okay. So, I mean, there is this, what I call this exploration expectation compromise. Uh, and you can also see it as the fact that the local kernel is going to compensate for the mismatch between your proposal and your targets. So I was telling you the flows are amazing. They're so flexible. You can do many different things, but still you cannot expect that they are going to do all of the job. And so this is why in a sense, you should be aware. You cannot learn it all. And also uh, traditional local kernels are still of great help. And it's more about combining forces than replacing one by the other. Okay, uh, what was next? Yeah, I got there to the <laughs> adaptive algorithms. And then, okay, I'm sorry, I guess. And then do I have these slides on incorporating more physics? Okay, I have also examples, but maybe I don't have so much time. So I will just let you know about one quick example. Uh, which was, again, this problem of Bayesian inference. So let's say that uh, we are here and we're observing this exoplanet, which we don't exactly observe. What we actually see is the star of this exoplanet. And because there's the exoplanet, they're actually orbiting the center of mass of the system. So from us, what we see are um, snapshots of the radial velocity along the orbit. So it's I simplified things, so I'm sorry if any astronomer is in the <laughs> is in the audience. But the simplest way of looking at it is that you have a radial velocity that is a periodic signal that has something like this, and you have observations at some given time of this radial velocity. And so maybe those observations were created by this uh, by this, these models, which correspond to a certain value of the parameters. So parameters being some offset, some amplitude, some period, some phase. But uh, what you can also realize is that actually, if I look at 
all the gray lines here, they could also be convincingly explaining the blue, the red dots, right? So this means that in the end, uh, with my four parameters, oops, sorry, I thought there was something else. With my four parameters here, I could have, have other values that would explain the models. And so we can frame a Bayesian inference problem out of it that will have a multimodal posterior distribution. So multiple values, different values of the parameters, and in particular, you can see different values of the periods would explain the data. And so it's it's a relative, oops, where is, okay, there's a problem in the order of the slides that I didn't see, oops, where is this? Hmm. I apologize. Okay. Okay, and so you know what you, you if you look at the posterior that this this problem is defining, you will see so here in the two dimensional projection with the logarithm of the period and the phase that you have different locations in these 2D planes that have parameters values that explain the data. And the problem is how do you estimate actually those different places? Because of course here it's a bridges side problem. It's in theory, it has many parameters. And so we've, we've shown that it was possible to learn this problem with the normalizing flow. And in particular, what you can see when you are launching the algorithm and you look at the number of iterations that you have an acceptance rate that is going to go up meaning that your normalizing flow is going to get better and better at mimicking your target distribution. And again, this acceptance rate, acceptance rate is going to give you the fast transitions between the different modes. And here we could check that indeed we were able to equilibrate really efficiently this, this problem. So, okay, and just to finish uh, with, with remarks, uh, since the time is almost up, is, uh, if we look at scaling to larger and larger system, this, this problem, because that's, that's definitely uh, something we should care about. There is this, this issue uh, that goes back also to something you were asking, although I'm not sure I can make it clear in a few minutes, you can come ask me afterwards. Um, that when we are computing this metropolis Hastings acceptance ratio, and it will be also the case, for example, for the importance weights, we have, uh, we can rephrase it this way where we have this exponential of minus differences between energies. So the, the target energies and what we could think about the energies of the normalizing flow. And here, okay, this you have no control over, but this, so whether or not uh, this delta u theta is going to be close enough to this delta u star, such that this is not always zero, is not at all trivial if you start increasing and increasing dimension. If you imagine that, okay, you're looking at a physical system, usually the energy is extensive. So it will have, it will scale as the number of particles or the number of dimensions you are interested in. Then probably you are going to make an error in learning it that is going to be about this order. And if you start having an error that is of this order, it means that you will have exponential to N. And so this is something that is likely to go wrong just as is. So this is uh, things that we are uh, currently thinking about in adapting those, those things. And there was one paper that was in particularly e exemplifying it. So it was on, on a statistical physics model that is called the five four model. But I mean, it's not so important, but just they were looking at larger and larger 
uh, models and they were tracking what's the value of these acceptance rates in their metropolis acing is basically using something like i was showing you and what they could see is that as the model was getting larger and larger the acceptance would plummet and in particular at the position where this model has a phase transition because this was as a function of, of temperature so you can see that there are still things to be to be solved about applying this, these methods and the important takeaway is is indeed that's okay but that's uh sorry mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i will manage up and so up oh, yeah and so an important the important takeaways are that we can say that there are some great opportunities in uh, applying those uh, deep generative modeling methods to try to speed up inference and Monte Carlo methods, uh, and with you know sub substantial speed up gains. But uh, we can also see that there are challenges uh, that are going to come uh, for us, and that's one idea that we have in order to tackle those challenges is to have models that are going to be more and more informed by the physics. So the fact that we constrain the models maybe to have the symmetries of the problems we are interested in. For example, here, uh, some papers were occupied about building normalizing flows that will have the geometries of torus or spheres, because those are things that people care about in physics uh, are, are really important. But there are many different ways in which you can try to physically condition the model. There is also some ideas of how to reduce dimensionality and still build on that for Monte Carlo methods, uh, separation of scales. And uh, finally, what I, if you're curious about looking into algorithms, uh, I have a couple of implementations that are up online, depending on, on whether you are PyTorch fans or JAX fans, you can look them up. And, and um, I mean, this one was more directed towards, uh, you know, just showcasing the first experiments. Uh, but this one is meant to become a full-blown package. So if you want to, you know, have a look and make feedback, uh, we'll be very happy. And with this, I'll thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take more questions. If there are some. So maybe we can also, we'll be all walking back the next talk since we see So uh -huh. any other questions, maybe yeah. we can talk to Mary Lou on the way. Yes. Um, all right, thank you again so much. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to our last session of the day. Um, I'm really happy to announce Greg, who is a postdoc here in CCB uh, in my group, actually. Um, and so he is going to talk today about some uh, neural architecture search, which at least one person was interested in the other day. Um, and just generally applying deep learning to genomics. So he's done some really great work on uh, deep learning methods development in genomics um, and sort of the unique challenges that genomics have, which we haven't heard a ton about up till now. So I'm hoping this will be a cool, slightly different perspective on a new science we haven't talked as much about with all these astrophysics-y things we've been doing. Um, and Frank is, has done a ton of work in this space. So this should be really great. And uh, yeah, okay. Thanks. I guess I'll take off my mask. Yeah, so, yeah, as Natalie mentioned today, I will probably talk a bit uh, different uh, application wise. It's uh, quite different uh, in terms of uh, computational genomics and computational bio biology. But I hope that the underlying methods will be similar and familiar enough. But uh, please do feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. So the outline of uh, today's talk is uh, I will first introduce uh, some uh, basics of uh, deep learning applications in genomics and uh, specifically using neural architecture search on NAS. Um, as I understand, uh, we have a pretty diverse audience here. So I want to make sure that uh, we have an overview of, of uh, what's happening. Uh, in general for uh, for applying uh, deep learning uh, in genomics. And uh, in the next two sessions, yeah, so I will specifically tell you two <clears throat> projects where uh, we applied NAS techniques to 
a model of genome, genome editing biotechnologies using CRISPR Cas9. So without further ado, let's first, first look at uh, uh, the modern genomics, right? So how many of you are familiar with uh, the concept of uh, genome-wide association studies? So not, not many, okay. But uh, this is really a classic example of uh, GWAS or genome-wide association studies. So basically here we are measuring different uh, individuals height together with their genotypes, right? So if we collect enough samples for those pairs of uh, height and uh, genotypes, we can run a very simple correlation analysis. So in this uh, hypothetical example here, uh, you can see this, uh, this RS123, that basically means a specific location in your genome. And at this particular location, different people have different alleles, we call it, which is really just a ACGT, one of those four DNA letters. When we do this correlation analysis, we will see that the number of A alleles in this particular location will increase your height by about five centimeters, right? So if you have two A alleles compared to people who have two G alleles, then your like uh, genetically will be high, higher, right? So as you can imagine that this simple correlation analysis underlying it is actually a large cohort of uh, people who have been all been genotyped. We know their genome sequences and also we know some uh, phenotypical variations. So this is what I mean by genomics is data driven because we really have these large collections of uh, different types of data. And uh, since the invention of uh, GWAS, Nowadays, we have really been able to do this uniformly across the genome for quite a number of uh, human diseases. So it's probably too small to read, but those, each of these is a different type of disease, such as a cardiovascular disease uh, or uh, uh, autoimmune diseases. And then on this, uh, this, each of those bars are one of the chromosomes in the human genome. And we can see that in each of those chromosomes, we have uh, thousands of uh, significant associations between those uh, number of allele counts to different types of uh, disease uh, disease and the phenotypical variations. So as I mentioned, this is underlying this is a tremendously amount of uh, data, both for phenotypical variations and also for uh, thousands of people's uh, genome sequences. And on the other hand, we not only measure the uh, variations on the DNA space, we also uh, look at the molecular variations. And here I'm using a single cell sequencing technology as, just as one specific example. So since the first invention of uh, sequencing a single human cell in probably like uh, 10 years ago, so every few, every other years, we will have a new biotechnology that can help us sequence more modalities within the single cell. So in computational biology, this really enables us to look at and study things that has not been possible to study before, because now we have those fast generations of uh, dial technology that can um, profile different dimensionalities in a single cell. So I hope this one is probably not news to this audience. Basically we have this fast evolution of machine learning uh, methods on the other hand. I'm just here uh, using convolution neural networks and uh, graph neural networks as two examples, right? So uh, over the years, CNN's gains a lot of popularity, but uh, ge uh, geometric deep learning is also uh, beginning to gain momentum. So next we will look at a few of those applications of the deep learning methods in, in two types of uh, genomics uh, applications, right? So remember that the genomics has so much data, so it's a perfect use, uh, use case to apply the deep learning methods. So in the first type of those applications, which I call it as a sequence to molecule predictions, where in the general framework, we basically just take the raw DNA sequences and one hot encode that into a four by N matrix. And then I they- I don't know if we know what one-hot encoding is. Yeah, so one-hot encoding <laughs> is basically you, you take a, a ACGT, those four DNA letters as four channels. So whenever you see one of those letters, uh, this is one. So the rest of the channels will be zero. 
you have uh, this uh, matrix that uh, corresponds to a specific chunk of DNA sequence. So this is now it's very similar to an image. We can apply those 1D convolutions to find those uh, local patterns along these DNA sequences. And then um, after that, use some uh, hidden layers to study the interactions of uh, those, uh, uh, what, 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 what we call as motifs, but really they're just uh, local patterns in your DNA sequences. And using this technique, we can predict a range of different uh, molecular variations, such as a protein binding site for this DNA sequence, gene expression level for this DNA sequence, or methylation and splicing. So those are different molecular phenotypes that we can all try to predict uh, using this given DNA sequence. Sorry, but yep. here you have labels, or you are just what? Yeah, great. Yeah, yes, we have labels, and that's precisely where I'm trying to go here. So basically, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the single cell scenario, right? So we can use experiments to profile uh, uh, what the what those about chemical markers look like along this whole genome. So imagine this line here; each of that uh, is a is a genome, and then. Uh, by calling some uh, some of the height of those uh, basically corresponds to the signal intensity for this given chunk of uh, DNA. So what we're trying to do is that uh, we input all these DNA sequences for this chunk, and then we'll try to predict the height of those experimental profilings. And this is precisely uh, one of the very uh, earliest, the earliest uh, application of a uh, multitasking uh, deep convolutional neural networks that are developing our group back in 2015. So we try to take a DNA sequence and try to predict the signal intensities, which corresponds to, to a range of uh, biochemical markers in that uh, part of the DNA. So of course you can also, using the same uh, type of uh, input output, you can also try to vary the neural networks architecture. So as I just mentioned, in the, in the very first early work, uh, we use a convolution pooling and uh, dense. And in the follow-up work, basically another group uh, added these recurrent, uh, bi-directional recurrent layers after these uh, convolutional layers. And this also has a very interesting biological implications because we know that DNAs are usually read by some proteins. And then when the proteins does that, it actually do this in a uh, linear sequential way. So by uh, by in incorporating those uh, bidirectional LSTM layers, it actually better captures the a lot of the data generating mechanisms. And they were indeed able to show that um, uh, this updated arch architecture was able to perform better than the original one. So in the second type of uh, deep learning models, we're not using the sequences. We're not restricted to the sequences, but we're more interested in predicting those molecule to phenotype predictions. So for example, here, uh, we're trying to predict the drug and the DNA interactions uh, for, the, for the cancer cell lines. So on the left, we have a similar to what we have before for the sequence, uh, it's uh, the mutations in those different cancers. And on the right, we have a fingerprint for those uh, different uh, uh, drug tumor drugs. So by considering those two jointly, we can try to make an interpretation, interpretable model that predicts um, uh, the growth effects of a different uh, tumor drugs. And interestingly, those uh, neural network architectures actually, uh, you might also already notice uh, this, this funny looking architecture. So this architecture is actually inspired by existing um, biological knowledge. So each of those uh, sparsi sparsification is uh, constrained by, by prior existing uh, biology, biology ontologies. So we can also do this uh, to predict the cancer types for, uh, for primary versus metastatic tumor in real patients. So previously it's in the cell lines, it's like on a plate. Now we're looking at real patients. And uh, similarly, we start with uh, mutations that are specific to any patient and try to predict 
uh, whether this particular patient's tumor is primary tumor or metastatic tumor. So just for the reference, it is the metastatic tumor that uh, is, uh, kills most of the patients. So those are the, we want to distinguish from the, the good tumor, relatively good tumors from the bad tumors by just looking at their uh, mutation signatures. So now this really, um, I want to wrap this up by this part up by uh, looking at the challenges and the opportunities for applying AI methods in medicine. So on the left side, as uh, we just discussed earlier, there's a rapid accumulation of uh, big data in this uh, biological domain for both, both on the DNA side and also for different molecular profilings. And uh, um, something that we didn't get to cover is those clinical data, such as the uh, electronic health records or medical imaging. But on the right hand, we also have a fast uh, evolution of a uh, more powerful cutting edge deep learning methods. So how to use these uh, 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 new generations of methods to model this large amount of data remains a challenge uh, for applying such techniques. So this is precisely where we developed uh, uh, neural architecture search methods uh, that is specifically for, uh, for genomics applications. So uh, this whole architecture search method is uh, powered by a reinforcement learning agent, uh, which is coded as a recurrent neural network. So before I go to the details, I just want to tell you that this search is uh, incredibly, incredibly efficient and we can finish a search searching a large model space in a very short time period of only 72 GPU hours. So next I will just tell a bit more about how NAS works, right? So suppose we try to learn a function um, that maps your input X to Y, right? So this, we can parameterize this function by a neural network. And in this case, uh, we have two uh, hyperparameters A or the architectures where it corresponds to like how many layers you have and uh, what type of computational operations you put in each layer. And once the architecture is fixed, within the each layer, you, we will have some trainable parameters that can be optimized by gradient descent. And those we call it as omega. So you can, you can already see that this has a nasty, nasty optimization flavor, right? So you first need to fix the architectures and then you can use uh, gradient descent to optimize omega. And specifically for uh, neural networks, uh, this A, we can do this in a layer by layer manner, right? So for example, if uh, we're, we're trying to determine the what computational operations to include in the third layer, A2, so uh, intuitively that will depend on the previous two layers. Right, so this mathematically, this is a conditional probability of uh, the teeth layer condition on all the previous layers. And in this toy example here, so suppose that the previous two layers are already convolutional layers, then for the A2 layer, you probably want a pooling layer. So this conditional probability is, uh, is being parameterized by this uh, recurrent neural network so that if you can capture all those autoregressive characteristics between different layers. Finally, how do we train this uh, conditional probability uh, generated by sigma theta? We can do this using a, a very uh, classic reinforcement learning method called reinforce. So basically you want to parameterize the likelihood of selecting a specific set of uh, architectures by this pi here, and then use the reward, uh, multiply this likelihood. So the objective eventually is to, we want to find a region where uh, we can sample these uh, high reward architectures with a large likelihood. So it's, yeah, it's very simple, but uh, this provides a general framework that we can build on, on top of it. For example, we can now, uh, between those uh, conditional probabilities, we can now insert uh, residual connections to make it more uh, complex and more powerful as well. But yeah, sorry. Where is the reinforcement learning coming in? It, yeah, it's the reward part. So is AK uh, like uh, some module or something and then 
that would be your action, I guess, choosing one of those. Yeah, so in, in this case, the, the actions are all chosen from the model search space, right? So it's the, the A is, is also your actions. And then the reward is uh, the, usually just uh, the validation accuracy, right? So um, you want to optimize the likelihood so that uh, if, uh, you want to move the gradients to a region where uh, the, the reward is high and move away from uh, regions where the remote the reward is negative or low. Okay, so uh, I guess why one, one more comment is uh, this is uh, very classic, but also um, we find it very useful in, empirically. But apparently, you can also use other uh, reinforcement learning techniques, such as uh, um, clipping the rewards and use a proximal proximal optimization, right? So in reality, this search algorithm really depends on how efficiently you can sample and determine the rewards. So another part that, that I didn't get to cover today is how you actually evaluate this reward. And uh, the reason why we can do this so efficiently is actually through this uh, weight sharing uh, scheme so that uh, we don't need to train each individual neural network to full convergence. Okay, so uh, now we have this method, we can apply this uh, to, to see if uh, we can actually improve upon the uh, genome, upon application in the geno genomics uh, domain. So here we're uh, applying this method back to this uh, classic multitasking deep convolutional neural network task, which is called a deep C uh, or that I mentioned earlier. So if you still remember that, we're trying to use a, a chunk of DNA and try to predict 900 uh, biochemical markers through this multitasking learning framework. So to compare against that, we first uh, sample this, uh, we define a model search space and uh, uniformly sample architectures from the same model space and uh, to form this uh, best performing randomly sampled model architecture called Ember Base. So in this architecture, different uh, operations are color coded. So because you are uniformly sampling those computation operations, you can see this, this architecture is fairly uh, colorful, right? So you, you, you tend to choose different uh, computation operations. And compare that to uh, our search model, which we denote as uh, Amber Seek, it's really just pre uh, prefer to use uh, three of uh, those computation operations. So which is uh, the convolution with kernel size eight, four, and uh, finish that with uh, the max pooling. So interestingly, the choices of these computational operations is highly aligned with the choices made by the human experts in the original implementation of deep sea. While at the same time, we were able to outperform the one designed by human experts by a pretty large margin while using a lot, a lot fewer trainable parameters. So this demonstrates that uh, the search model is both accurate and parameter efficient. So Ember is a, a software to perform now. So it's uh, publicly available and reusable across uh, biological, biological domains. So for example, as I mentioned earlier in type Y models, we're trying to uh, use a sequence as input and try to predict a range of uh, biochemical markers uh, we can just follow this very similar uh, logics, even though the, the the biological applications could be totally different. Yeah. Uh, so I I get what you did here. Mm -hmm. uh, how is it like? I mean, in like these days, there are like so many neural architecture search methods, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like, is do you have like some sort of comparison, like uh, like Amber versus? Uh, yeah, I'll get to that uh, later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, but before that, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, this framework is uh, reusable across different uh, biological domains. So as I mentioned here, we're trying to predict uh, biochemical markers. And then in the later part of my today's talk, we'll, um, I'll tell you how this can be applied to CRISPR-Cas9. Good question. Yep. Um, what is specific to biologic domains in AMBER? Is it just that it sort of expects a sequence input? Yeah, that's certainly one thing. And I'll, I, 
I'll answer that in the right in the next uh, slide. <laughs> so yeah. So I've also been thinking about what's so specific for applying nasty biology, right? So one big difference is that in biology, we are using the same, we can generate the data in, in the same format, but they actually corresponds to very, very different biological factors, right? So here, what is shown here is uh, we, we're sharing uh, the same model search space, but for different uh, biological uh, factors. So basically, uh, if you look at those transfer factors, which is a specific type of proteins that binds to DNAs, uh, it really tends to use this uh, convolutional layer with a larger kernel size of 20, right? So versus uh, this green band, which is a histone, uh, this is a chemical modification happening on DNA and uh, like the pr proteins that wrap around DNAs. So they actually prefer to use a smaller kernel size. And uh, we know that this is actually interesting because uh, uh, transferring factors tends to have a larger motif versus histone marks will have a smaller one. So the difference, different preference of the uh, architectures actually can correspond to some of this uh, underlying biological, um, biological mechanisms. And another interesting uh, phenomena is that uh, we usually see those divergence of uh, architectural preferences in the early layers, right? So if you look at the first of three layers, it tend to be very factor specific. But uh, by the end of this, this side, we're trying to, we're going to the output, then you can see all the bands starts to converge and they're really just using the most efficient way uh, architecture regardless of the uh, biological factors. Um, so this is really very different because in, in computer vision, you are trying to find this foundation model that can be applied and uh, just by fine tuning to different, uh, different applications versus in genomics, because we have such diverse uh, factors, proteins uh, in, the, in the genome, each of them will need a specific, uh, specific architecture to, to, to accommodate uh, the specific needs of this data. Um, so if there are no questions, I'll move on. Sorry, yeah. I that I don't really understand the, how is this called, alluvial plot? Like what, so the width means like... Yeah, yeah, so the width actually means the transition probabilities, right? So remember that when I talk about the NAS basics, we are really just trying to learn this conditional probabilities. And the band will correspond how the, the transition probability is across different uh, layers. So, but this is, but you're saying that different biological factors map to different neural network architectures. Mm -hmm. How is the neural network architecture represented here? So. Yeah, so basically if you look, look at this uh, red band, which is uh, a specific uh, biological factor, uh, so the the optimal architecture will follow this uh, the thickest uh, red band, versus another one, the green one, will choose a different ones or the yellow one, right? So yellow one will use average pooling, versus the red one will use uh, max pooling for this uh, specific layer. Gotcha. So you construct those widths because you search. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So be because we search for different uh, balance right. factors. And apparently, this uh, um, this is there is a problem of uh, computational uh, cost here. So, toward in the future, we'll move forward to apply these uh, training-free um, NAS techniques, so that we don't need to spend so much time searching for um, best architectures across a, a number of uh, biological factors. But uh, the use of uh, NAS or Amber as a software is not just for uh, on the DNA sequences. So an independent group from uh, CMU actually benchmarked this on uh, another one dimensional data uh, called the electrical cardiograms, so or ECG. So ECG is a medical technique that can profile uh, your heart rate and then use that to help diagnose a range of uh, cardiovascular disease. So they, they use a, a publicly available data and the data looks like this. So basically we have around uh, 60 seconds 
of those uh, 1D signal sampling. And we're trying to predict one of those four classes based on this uh, uh, 60 seconds recording, whether this is normal disease, other or just purely random noise. So the authors applied several uh, NAS methods on using this uh, same publicly available data and also compare that uh, to uh, uh, a randomly uh, wired or uh, wide residual neural network. So we can see that for the ECG data set, Amber really works uh, the best out of the box. And uh, the author is all, was also able to reproduce uh, some of the results in the deep sea task, which I just told, mentioned to you earlier. And in both cases, Amber is really working um, working very well compared to not only the competing NAS methods, but also the, uh, the, the random wiring baselines. So, so Amber is also very easy to use. So basically this is a script that token from uh, the benchmarking paper. Uh, and uh, you just need uh, to import and set up the model space and then write your own functions uh, to read in your training and uh, validation testing data and uh, hit a wrong button. And uh, since uh, the new release, this 70 lines of uh, wrong configurations can also be pickled. So you just need to reload it um, to just make uh, the use of Amber even easier. Um, so next I will tell you a little bit more about our own applications of Amber in, in the uh, field of uh, genome editing. So in the first part, I will tell you how uh, a deep residual convolution neural network can be used to predict the editing outcomes for crispr cas which is the most popular genome editing tools out there. And this work is done by Victoria, uh, one of uh, my very uh, prominent students. So CRISPR-Cas9 <laughs> is a revolutionary biotechnology that can edit your genome. So it works by this. So Cas9 itself is an enzyme and uh, it can be charged by a guide RNA. And this guide RNA is, a uh, uh, you can program it for it to be complementary to a specific target in your human genome. So when you trans, uh, transfect those uh, guide RNA and the enzyme complex into cells, uh, this enzyme will find the target uh, that is complementary to your programmed guide RNA and perform a cut. So it has long been thought that uh, the repairs of those uh, double strand break induced by this cut of uh, Cas9 is purely random. So until recently, people start to realize that they're actually predictable. So what I mean by Cas9 editing outcomes. So uh, let's look at this specific example here. So suppose we are programming the Cas9 to target this part, this set of the sequence, and the Cas9 will precisely make a cut uh, this dashed line here. So after the cut, there's a, a DNA repair pathway in the, in the cells that will come and repair this brand, uh, double strand break. And around 60% of the time, after the repair of this break, we will see additional A being inserted right after the cut site. And about 4% of the time, we'll see a deletion of three nucleotides that looks like this. So this 60% and 4% is reproducible no matter how many times you do the same experiment, as long as you're targeting this specific set of uh, sequence. So this is a perfect uh, scenario to perform uh, machine learning because we know that the input is this targeting sequence and try, we try to predict what's the uh, percentages associated with this sequence. So there indeed exists a few number of uh, uh, machine learning methods that can, yeah. I didn't completely get like the setup here. So we perform some cutting on the original sequence. Mm -hmm. And then when this gets repaired, we see these changes. Yes. Okay. And this, uh, these uh, changes are associated with uh, the original, uh, original sequence okay. so that we can use the original sequence to try to predict the repair outcomes. And we don't know like why these why these particular sequences like we know some uh, some some uh, biological mechanisms. So for example, this since one base pair insertion is mostly regulated by your particular repair enzyme. Okay. 
that prefers to bind certain sequences, but not the others. So there are some uh, um, reasoning behind why we can predict this. Okay. Okay, so, so there exist uh, three machine learning methods in this domain to try to use this uh, original sequence try and try to predict the outcomes. So um, they use different uh, machine learning methods. So for example, you know, very early, the, the very first work uses the artificial neural networks with the nearest neighbors and um, follow up works using uh, gradient, bo gradient boosting machines or logistic regressions. But the common feature of all those three works is that they first use feature engineering to derive informative features from this input uh, DNA sequence. And then they have to tune their model parameters before the model can be uh, deployed. So we reasoned that by utilizing their data, publish the data, we can actually do better uh, by employing both the deep CNN and uh, uh, the technique of NAS. So the objective for this project is you first want to create a model and see if that can perform better than the previous ones, and then apply that to genomic variations in patients. So in the first step, uh, we try to create a new model called Croton, where we take these one hot encoded DNA sequences and try to predict six different outcomes. Again, this is a multitasking uh, learning framework. So compared to the existing methods, so if we use a deep convolutional neural network, we can bypass this feature engineering step and directly take the raw sequences as input because we know that CNNs is excellent at a, a learning patterns and features from uh, those textual data. And we can, if we further couple that with uh, Amber or NAS, we can even further skip this model engineering. So creating this end-to-end -end uh, data acquisition to model deployment pipeline. So that's precisely what we did. So in the first step, we want to evaluate whether this model search step actually uh, gives us better performance than just you know random, random mis sampling from the same model space. So we see that uh, compared to these uh, sampled architectures, our search model is indeed performing uh, better than 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 almost all of these uh, sampled CNNs from the same model space. So the reason why that's the case is because, again, we prefer to find a specific, uh, specific computational operations among these uh, uh, candidate operations. And in this specific case, we're, uh, looking, we're seeing that uh, the dilated convolution with a kernel size of eight is being almost universally preferred uh, than the rest of these convolution, convolution operations. And again, this is biologically meaningful because the repairs are dependent uh, on some uh, complementary patterns that are far away. So by using this uh, dilated convolution, we can actually increase the receptive field to capture those uh, uh, similarities that are not immediately in the local neighborhood. So now, yep. The amber can change the number of layers as well, right? Or do you fix the number of layers you want? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so right now we can amber we set a maximum number that is determined by the model space, and a, a, a layer can be removed by choosing this identity layer. So, if you have this identity layer, that will be removed. But uh, um, that is mostly uh, functions through this. Uh, validation accuracy as your reward. So if you are using too many of those complex uh, complex operations, then that will hurt your validation performance and then this will be um, downweighted. Okay, so now we have uh, shown that uh, the search uh, CNN indeed performs better than a randomly sampled CNN architecture we want to compare that to this uh, existing machine learning methods. So quite surprisingly, uh, we were training on this forecast data set and we show that this uh, and then tested on this uh, another sprout data set, right? So we that in that way, we can really make this uh, evaluation complete, completely independent. And we show that uh, in this independent data set, we were 
outperforming this uh, previous two methods in Delphi and forecast. And even uh, for this uh, machine learning method that is specifically trained on this uh, T cell data set, the Sprout data set. So this really indicates that our um, automatically designed model was generalizing extremely well. That is not just uh, works very well on this training, training validation data set, but also on this uh, different cellular context that is held out through, uh, throughout this entire process. So because we didn't do any of the feature engineering, we still want to understand what are the nucleotides, what are the features that uh, the quantum model is using to make such accurate predictions. So in order to understand this, we use a technique called uh, in silico mutagenesis, which is essentially just a perturbation-based uh, interpretation methods. And each time we will uh, mutate one of those DNA bases, where we have A, C, G, and T. If we remember, for example, from A to T, how does that change our uh, model's prediction? So if we do that for each of the, every location across this uh, 60 base pair or six, uh, 60 long vector input, we can see that um, the latter changes around the cut side in the middle of those 60 base pairs is the most important. And this is actually aligned uh, with the existing biophysical studies of cut side enzyme. And uh, by comparing the influence of uh, those base pairs across different tasks, we can also start to see some interesting patterns. So for example, for one base pair insertion, it's really just utilizing the, a few nucleotides that are near the cutting side versus for more complex uh, biological outcomes, such as the frame shift, it's using a much larger window of nucleotides that are spreading across almost all 60 base pairs. So we can uh, we find, finally we wrap up this uh, machine learning method by developing a Django. Um, let's see if we can get this to work, but uh, a small Django application. So basically, if we input the sequence and hit predict, this will tell you uh, the model's prediction. So um, just to make it a little bit user friendly for those experimental. Uh, users, because after all, we want this uh, the people who actually perform custom experiments uh, to be able to use this. And a lot of times, they don't, they don't necessarily know how to run a Python code. So now that we have a good performing machine learning model, we want to study the genetic variations that can influence the uh, editing outcomes. Yeah. So just to understand in Croton, like mm -hmm. the main kind of like advantage is this neural architecture search, right? Like that's your yeah. main contribution. Okay. So yes, so the neural architecture search was able to give us a better performance than the, than the other uh, computing methods. And uh, because of the fact that we didn't use any of the feature engineering, mm -hmm. uh, that also gives us unbiased uh, feature importance scores. Okay. Yeah. So from the previous figure, it seems that uh, maybe an attention mechanism will change the performance because it will focus in the middle. Right, exactly. So yeah, that's a very good point. So basically, if we just want to predict a one base pair insertion, we don't actually need all those 60 base pairs. All we need is just this uh, center part. Um, but on the other hand, for this more complex frame shift, then uh, we are actually using a lot more uh, sequences. And you're right, if we use this attention mechanism, actually that will help us to find this distant, um, the similarities that are quite far away. Yeah. Okay, so genetic variation, yeah, go ahead. You have like a confidence score or like uh, error bars on the predictions? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I don't think we have one, <laughs> but I, I, I love to have that because uh, I think that the uncertainty for for deep learning methods, right, at least of, it's very important for biological applications, but uh, I don't see many of that given yet. Yeah. So, okay, 
genomic variations. <laughs> um, I assume like a, a lot of you still uh, uh, are not so familiar with the concept of uh, genomic variations of why Cas9 is important to that. So just to get us on the same page, CRISPR-Cas9 has been used to treat multiple um, diseases in ongoing clinical trials. And they can be classified roughly in two routes. In the first one, we're, we can use that to treat uh, to, for antiviral therapies. So for example, we know that HIV enters the human cells through a protein called CCR5. So if we can knock out, basically destroy that CCR5 gene, then HIV will, HIV will have no way to enter human cells. And uh, uh, this is why we can use Cas9 to, for antiviral therapies. And on the, on the other hand, perhaps, perhaps more promising is to treat cancers. So basically cancers have a mechanism to secrete uh, specific uh, signal proteins to, to repress uh, humans' immune cells. So if we can extract some of those immune cells from the patient and then edit out this uh, immune blockage gene that uh, suppresses the immune cell and then uh, inject those edited cells back to the patient, then those immune, edited immune cells will act as uh, patient-specific weapons to target the tumor cells and uh, destroy them. So this has been used in this ongoing clinical trial to treat lung cancer patients. Yeah. Uh, so do we have like antivirals that use these like CRISPR-based methods? <laughs> That's a great point. So a few years ago, <laughs> it's a you know, completely unethical application. <laughs> uh, someone actually tried to edit out CCR5 in embryonic stem cells. So basically the newborn babies will be born immune to HIV. Um, so, but that's completely unethical. So don't do that. <laughs> um, but uh, there are some other um, ongoing efforts that are ethical, but uh, they're not as nearly as far as these uh, cancer immunotherapies. Is there some particular reason? Like, uh... Yeah, so mostly because these cancer immunotherapies, you can extract the cells, edit that, and then inject back. So at this step, right, you can do a lot of lab work for those cells to make sure that they are safe and effective. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so uh, at this point, I hope that uh, you, you at least uh, get a sense that uh, CRISPR-Cas9 can be used and actually is already being used uh, in, in some uh, ongoing clinical trials to treat human disease. But why is uh, this single nucleotide variations or genomic variations so important. So the reason is that the human genome is actually loaded with different genetic variations. Um, I guess on a high level, we all know that everyone is, is different. And so everyone's uh, genome is also different on specific locations. And in this specific example, what are, we're, we're seeing here is uh, you have the reference genome, you will have a uh, 90% uh, one base pair insertion probability, and only 10% of the cells will not generate one base pair in, uh, insertion probability. And in this case, we wanted the insertion to destroy the gene, right? So 90% of the time, uh, you will have a success edit. Versus if you in these alternative alleles, basically it's the allele that is uh, seen less than 50% in the human population, then this allele could really change your editing probabilities from 90% to 40%. Then this uh, a targeted therapy for, uh, for someone with this C allele could be a, a, a huge success with 90% of the chance to destroy this gene versus for anyone with this A allele is not working extremely well. And this will create this differing gene inactivation efficacy and uh, eventually lead to this uh, difference in the uh, cell-based uh, therapy efficacy. So we run Croton uh, uniformly across the genome and then uh, specifically picked a few genes that has been utilized in, in clinical trials or has the potential to be used. 
And we see that for each of those genes, uh, those natural occurring genetic variations, like the one that I just showed you, C2A uh, mutation, can actually significantly alter the predicted uh, uh, editing outcomes uh, as large as 30%. So to make things even worse, some of those uh, variants can actually be linked to specific uh, ethnicities and genetic backgrounds. So for example, here we are looking at a particular gene called FGFR3, which is a biomarker for uh, several tumors. And suppose we want to edit this gene using a PAM ID, which is a specific location in this gene um, called 147. So if you, again, if you have this reference allele, which is like seen over 50% in this uh, in human population. Uh, so the knockout efficiency is actually pretty high, it's over 80%. But if you have this alternative allele of C in this particular location, that will significantly decrease the knockout efficiency by 20%. So you only have 60% of this success to edit out this gene. And um, in this particular case, the C, the C allele is actually very, very frequent in this African population. So one out of, almost one out of three people with a African genetic background will actually carry this C allele instead of the T allele. So if we are actually targeting uh, this region in a clinical trials, this, is, this will not be a very good choice because uh, for anyone who with, carries this uh, C allele, uh, it will significantly decrease the efficacy. So you might think this is uh, still far away from uh, clinicals or in human trials. So next I'm going to show this gene, which is the one used in ongoing clinical trials called PDCD1 to treat uh, lung, lung cancer patients. So this is uh, the gene that we're trying to target. So uh, they have different axons and neutrons, basically the structure of the gene. And then each column is one potential target site for CRISPR-Cas9. So you might not be able to see it very clearly, but uh, for each column here, we have a small little horizontal bar here that represents the reference, uh, reference allele prediction. And then each of the dots is actually the prediction when you alter one of those uh, uh, SMVs, single nucleotide variations. So the first thing is uh, I hope you can appreciate that um, by considering those natural occurring genetic variations, we're actually introducing a large amount of variations uh, on top of those reference predictions. So meaning that it was, uh, you consider those uh, differences in everyone's genome, uh, the effic predicted efficacy could actually be varied a lot. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to those two orange boxes. So those two orange boxes are being used in this ongoing clinical trial. And for at least one of them right here, we can see that one uh, single nucleotide variations can dramatically decrease uh, the, the predicted uh, efficiency uh, of uh, one base per insertion, which means that for anyone who carries this uh, genetic variation, his or her outcomes will be dramatically different from the rest of the cohort. Again, which is something that we don't want. And to facilitate um, the use of this uh, in, a, in a clinical and experimental community, we make a database called CrotonDB that can systematically uh, query these uh, different uh, genetic variations and target sites. And again, here I'm showing that uh, another high impact journal uh, paper in cell uh, where the authors try to knock, knock down CD33 uh, again, they have an even larger effect size for a particular SMV with as large as 40%. So um, I guess we can conclude with uh, that this effect is actually quite ubiquitous and it's important to actually consider those SMVs uh, when designing tar clinically used uh, guide RA targets for CRISPR-Cas9. So for, the first, for this part, I will just uh, summarize as a uh, we developed this uh, fully automated and uh, state-of-the-art performance crispr cas editing uh, outcome predictor called Croton. And uh, because it's uh, fully automated and we don't rely on any feature engineer and prior knowledge, we can use it to, to unbiasedly estimate the genetic variations effects. And we show that indeed 
by considering those effects, we can actually give meaningful and insights uh, to guide the clinical use of CRISPR-Cas9. Okay, so next uh, part. Um, so then in this part, I'll describe another important step for CRISPR-Cas9, which is the off-targeting effect. So off-targeting effects, and I want to acknowledge uh, Adam, who is my uh, colleague at uh, the Simons Foundation, and also who's, uh, who has uh, contributed a lot to the biophysics side of the story. So CRISPR-Cas9 uh, off-target effects means that uh, the, yeah. Well, I just want to clarify like what you did like previously just before we get into this. Mm -hmm. So we have this model that tells us like if I edit out uh, uh, some target sequence, uh, I mean, if sorry, if I if I use CRISPR on some, if I cut out some part of a target sequence, what would what would be the resulting repair stunt, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you use this to analyze uh, the variance. Like, so if I change like one nucleotide to another, uh, how the effects would change? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, this is particularly useful in this uh, clinical studies because everyone's genome is different. Okay. So this model now tells you if I remove, if I change one nucleotide, like this is how the repairs are going to be different. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So. I guess uh, following on that, we've seen a lot of uh, analysis on how this uh, DNA's cut can be repaired. And now we're moving actually, uh, we're taking one step back and see which of those uh, genomic locations will actually be cut. That happens before the repair, right? So this is denoted as off-targeting effects where those uh, genomic sequences that are similar to your programmed guide RA but not identical will be cut by mistake, generating these off-target effects. And this is really a serious problem, if, especially if we want to use that for therapeutics, um, because uh, even a very low frequency of the cells are caught by mistake. Like even a single cell is caught by mistake um, and become uh, cancerous. In the long run, that one single cell can expand and replicate itself over the many times and years to come. And then eventually the patient will, be, will develop a very severe cancer. So we want to minimize the off-targeting effects. But that's not always uh, easy because, for example, if you look at this uh, figure here, this, uh, this is experimental data uh, from a few years ago. What we're trying to target to edit is in, in this uh, green bar. But all those red bars will also be edited just because they, have, they bear some similarities to this uh, green bar, right? So, it's really important to understand which of those uh, uh, red bars will be edited besides this green one and how to minimize that. So for that, we need to understand Cas9 as an enzyme is uh, kinetics. So how fast is it going to cut the on-target sites versus how fast is going to target the off-target sites. But uh, the existing off-target data as the one that I just showed you earlier cannot actually a profile the kinetic rates, the time resolved kinetic rates. So they usually just use high throughput sequencing uh, reads as the surrogate. And uh, that cannot distinguish uh, the enzyme specific uh, characteristics to, uh, for example, how long you expose the enzyme to your DNA substrates and uh, the genetic context. And uh, if we're trying to build this uh, kinetic model, right? So uh, for example, this about physical model that uh, uses a uh, kinetic theories to transit between different states, we are encountering some other difficulties such as we don't know how many states are valid during this binding and cleaving uh, process and uh, which of the transition rates are the fastest or slowest. So we can, try to address this uh, challenge by using a specific form of, yep. I think I'm just like a lit, little bit unfamiliar with CRISPR. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain what is like the role of the gRNA and Cas9 in this whole process? Yeah, yeah. So I guess that for that, we need to go back <laughs> a little bit.
So class nine is this protein, right? The protein will cut DNAs. It's like a scissors, it just cuts the DNA. And then this uh, protein can, uh, can be charged with a, a, a programmable guide RNA, which is a 20 base pair, right? So, so you can ask some bio, biotech companies to synthesize this guide RNA, right? The synthesized guide RNA will, will be complementary to a specific region in your genome, that is your target region. Okay. And then uh, Cas9, once you charged with uh, this guide RNA, is called the RNG complex. So basically, it means the protein with this uh, RNA is a complex. And then you transfect that to the cells, and then Cas9 will search along the genome uh, to find the target region that are similar to your programmed guide RNA and perform the cut. So the reason why we have these off-target uh, events is because our gRNA is like making mistakes, like it's going to, yes. it's finding with the wrong targets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So across the genome, there will be places that are very similar to your gRNAs, although not okay. identical. So if it's identical, it's not off target, it's on target. We try, we were trying to edit that place. Mm -hmm. But even sometimes, uh, like uh, this is uh, not 100% identical, it will be also be edited by mistake. And the important part is where will, not just where will be edited, but how fast different places will be edited. So that's why it's so essential to understand the kinetics for this uh, process. So on targets, uh, like uh, the correct sequences are kind of, they are operated on much faster. Yes. Is that the intuition? Yes. Okay. But not, um, we actually see some, some, uh, um, some cases where the mutations can operate almost as fast as the on target. Okay. Um, so that's um, that's also something that we're trying to delineate. Because the, they're like biochemically complementary, right? The other the guide RNA strand, so it should biochemically attach much better to the closest yep. match. Right. Is the like mechanism right for speed? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, yeah, so I hope that um, we're clear that why understanding this kinetics is so important. And uh, by the way, it's a uh, great question. Just feel free to ask anything if, uh, you, if you lost at any point. Um, but uh, yeah, so biophysically, we can use a master equation to model these transitions between, st between states. And uh, for, for in this particular case, we are modeling the constant cutting as a first order um, kinetic reaction. And uh, we assume there are four different uh, states, right? So there's a free enzyme that are floating around and then starts to bind uh, in the first initial step of the guide RNA and the DNA complex uh, goes, uh, then it goes on to this intermediate R loop and then finally close R loop, then there will be, then Cas9 will perform the cut. So biophysically, we can use this master equation to describe this uh, um, this uh, whole system. And uh, to find this actual effective cleavage rate, um, Thomas King and Altman around 50 years ago uh, discovered that uh, they can use a partition function like um, term to describe the steady state occupancy uh, by multiplying different uh, vertices. Um, and uh, once we have this uh, long steady state occupancy and probability, we can multiply this uh, by this cut rate so that we can get this effective cleavage rate. And uh, there are two parts of this uh, process that can be modeled by a neuron, specific type of neural network called a kinetic Inform, kinetics informed neural networks, which I will describe in detail next. So the first part is the to finding the sequence determinants of those uh, different uh, kinetic rates. So for example, for K-on, um, it depends on the first uh, four nucleotides and K-off may depend on some other uh, sequence uh, sequences along this uh, uh, 20 base pair sequence. And we're modeling this uh, sequence dependency by a convolutional neural network. 
And in the second part, we want to understand how those uh, which of the how those rays are uh, being trans transitioned uh, among each other. So for that, we can use a graph to, to describe this. So for in this particular case, it's just really three uh, three states. It's an enzyme enzyme substrate complex, enzyme product complex, and goes back to enzyme. But in reality, we don't know uh, if there, how many states are there and which which of the states transition transitions to which. So for that, we can use this King Altman theory to convert this graph into a soft max layer uh, that is right here. And then we can use this uh, uh, final catalyzed uh, state to and uh, multiply that by the uh, K cat as the effective uh, kinetic rate. So Apparently, this, there are several choices that we need to make uh, in order to implement a kinetically informed neural network. So I, we can do this again through the means of uh, NAS. So in this particular case, we can first uh, generate a, a, a population of those uh, King models and then evaluate their uh, reward by looking at this validation Pearson correlation from a predicted rate and a, a, a observed rate. And some of those better architectures will survive through this selection that goes to the probabilistic model distribution and generate a posterior probability for your models. Then you can sample from this model posterior to generate a new population and this iterations just goes for a loop. And uh, for, of course, we want to benchmark if this uh, genetic algorithm, probabilistic genetic algorithm actually works. So to do that, we first uh, simulated uh, kinetic data um, and then apply this framework. And we see that on this x-axis is the number of uh, generations or the uh, time of training. We see that indeed, uh, we get better and better models over time by updating this uh, uh, model posterior probability. and. Uh, Eventually, we can arrive at a very good model that captures the underlying ground truth. Versus if we disable the uh, posterior update of model distribution, uh, over time, we will also be able to find uh, better models just by random chance. But uh, you can see the performance difference is quite dramatic. And because this is synthetic data, we can also compare the posterior model distribution to the ground truth physical parameters that are actually gen we use to generate this uh, uh, simulated data. And indeed, we see that this whole process was able to capture uh, this model generation, uh, data generating process very accurately. So these uh, dashed lines in the middle are the ground truth values and uh, the blue bars are this posterior distribution. We saw that they are almost a perfect, perfectly aligned uh, with the ground truth. So no, now this gives us uh, faith that we can apply this framework to actually model the uh, real Cas9 kinetic data. And uh, the data we took from uh, a recent uh, biotech, Nature Biotech paper where they, what they did is that uh, they, uh, they performed this massively parallel kinetic profiling for CRISPR-Cas9, where at each time point they try to get a sample of this DNA is a measure of what, how many of that is being cut and how many is not, not being cut. And then they can fit an exponential decay function to, uh, to measure the, 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 the decay rate, which is the effective cleavage rate that we're trying to predict. So before that, this again is a perfect uh, case for machine learning. We have an input, which is this guide RA and this uh, target with some mismatches and we have this uh, cleavage rate as the exponential fit. Uh, we don't apply this uh, interpreter model. We just use a convolution, regular convolutional neural network and try to predict this uh, exponential fit. So here uh, again, this x-axis is number of steps or like number of, uh, or you can think of this as a uh, surrogate for time. And we can see over time, indeed, we can search better and better uh, CNNs to model this data. And the best performance is shown here. We have a pretty good correlation of a, a Pearson correlation of 0.88 um, from the observed rate and the, our predicted rate. 
So next, we apply the same process using the same features and outputs, but uh, use this uh, kinetic informed neural net. So you can see that this is very similar to this uh, simulated case where um, over time we were able to find better and better models. And in this case, the test and performance is actually 80, around 86. So compared to this uh, CN model, we are indeed losing a little bit of power, but uh, considering this uh, interpretability, it's actually doing fairly well. And most importantly, things are, is uh, interpretable and physical, right? So first of all, we look at the posterior model distributions and uh, we can understand which of those, which are the sequence determinants for each of those kinetic rates. So for example, KIO means the kinetic rate of transitioning from uh, intermediate state to the open R loop state. And we see that those, uh, the, the sequence determinants are actually starting from the, the third nucleotide versus for uh, the other two kinetic rate that are intermediate to close and or cl back, close back to intermediate, they actually depend on quite different uh, sequence determinants like uh, on the 16th, nucleotide or on the 12th nucleotide. I have a question here. Sure. So you, you have a set of ODs, right? How you know that like the method is identifying the truth, like if, if it is identifiable, you know? Wait, say that again. If, if the model is identifiable, like if, like if you simulate the, the system with para rates, you know how you know if the method is structured truth yeah so in this case um you're right so basically uh, in this case we don't know the ground truth we're exploring this uh exploring this uh, cost line because no no one really know uh what's the ground truth in this case yeah. and uh, the reason why we are <coughs> we feel comfortable doing this is because the, in the synthetic data we're able to recover the true true rates so well uh, so just to understand this, uh, your your network like predicts like the different uh, rates, like the constant k that you are showing, yep. and that governs like the dynamics of your like how much of each reactant is consumed. And uh, so you actually don't have access to the rates themselves. You only have access to like the time evolution of the different reactants. Yep. But. Uh, Okay, so you can yeah. differentiate through everything. That's like the, yes. Yeah. So we don't <clears throat> we don't really know the the intermediate rates. All we know is the um, is the final like a cle effective right. cleavage rate. You're right. right. Yes. Okay. Um, and more importantly, we want to show that the learned kinetic rates are actually physical. They have a unit of a uh, y over per second, and uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we can actually learn those uh, intermediate rates as a bonus point. And uh, just to demonstrate that this is actually correct. So my collaborator, Adam, plugged in those uh, learned kinetic rates and uh, run his Monte Carlo physical simulations. So basically, if this is the actual rate, do we, does this generate uh, the data that are similar to what we saw? And it turns out it's indeed the case. Um, so when we plugged in the learned kinetic rates into uh, the simulation, uh, we can get, uh, get a log de exponential decay that are just uh, similar to what we experimentally measure. And uh, we can also observe uh, the state occupancy over time. So we can see that <clears throat> the fitted uh, effective cleavage rate is uh, highly concordant uh, with our predictions. So finally, I want to go back to where we started, is uh, off-targeting effect predictions. So at the end of the day, we want to be able to distinguish which of those uh, places in the genome will be edited versus which will be not. So in this case, again, we are using the test data set uh, for, from this, actually where this figure comes from called GuideSeq. So it's important to note that this GuideSeq data sets are actually generated in living cells or in, uh, in jargon, we call it in vivo, versus our training data, because we want to measure these uh, costa enzymes' uh, intrinsic characteristics, they're actually performed out of the living cells. 
or we call that in virtual. So that really tells us like we are using different experimental approaches and they're done in different cellular contexts. So this test data set is really, really challenging. And here the task is that we want to predict which of those sequences will actually be off-target edited versus uh, some of the sequences that uh, are within the same timing distance, but they are not edited. So that's the, the classification problem. So we applied this uh, in biophysics interpretable neural network and the CNN, remember we have raw ember on both of that to this task and they compare both of them across a, different, a set of uh, different baselines uh, on this held out task data set. And surprisingly, we see that uh, this uh, interpretable mechanistic model actually performs much better, <laughs> not just to other baselines, but also actually much better than, than this uh, CNNs. And we speculate this is because uh, in this uh, kinetic interpreter neural networks, we inject such strong biophysical priors that when you test on this out of domain testing data sets, they actually performs better than, uh, than a regular like non-interpretable CNN. And finally, uh, we can look at just this uh, uh, off-target edited uh, size. And not all of them are off-target edit at the same level. Some will be, edited more than the others. And uh, these are represented by different number of reads uh, in this coming off the experiment. So for the reads that are like for 2000 to 5000, indeed we are predicting that to have a very large cleavage rate versus uh, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the off target editing size that with uh, only zero to five um, number of reads, they are indeed also predicted with a much lower cleavage rate. And this is true across all four different experimental approaches conducted in different cellular contexts. So this tells us that we are not only able to make this distinction between zero and one, but even with the positive classes, uh, our cleavage rate prediction can actually tell you which one of them is more edited than the others. Sorry, I have a question. Like if so the Hamming distance is just if the letter was different, okay. And if you have a sequence, is have you tried like to use any other I don't know like identity white descent or some other distance that? No. So I think in, in this case, this uh, this uh, construction of a uh, testing set is actually a uh, uh, widely used uh, uh, data set in the previously generated by others. So we're in order to make fair comparisons oh, where we're yeah, fixing that. Makes sense. Yeah. So I guess finally to summarize it, uh, I present you uh, a, a genetic algorithm based uh, neural architecture search technique that can search for this uh, kinetically interpretable neural networks. And uh, we show that this King can shed mechanistic insight for this custom enzyme editing. And it actually outperformed uh, to our surprise uh, this uh, a lot of the state of the art uh, uh, of targeting pr predictors are based on previous machine learning methods. So to wrap up my today's talk, I told tell you a few types of uh, deep learning applications specifically for genomics and why uh, it's so important to develop and apply the technique of NAS in genomics, and uh, to follow followed by two specific examples uh, that are both related to genome editing uh, on how we can use um, neural architecture search to both generate accurate and interpretable and mechanistic models uh, to understand uh, genome editing better. And uh, I want to thank my lab mates at uh, CCB and Princeton University. Um, and also I want to advertise myself. I, my own lab is starting uh, this uh, September. So if you, you or you know someone who will be interested in working and exploring deep learning in genomics and medicine, please uh, do reach out to me. Thank you. I, I just, for curiosity, why, why is that different architectures map to different uh, features? Like, do you? No one, so someone knows it, or is most? I mean, it's, it's so curious, right? Like, 
Uh, which part of the work are you like before? different like the neural architecture research like you like the alluvial plot or i don't know how you call it like the oh the senki plot so, yeah the senki plot yeah. yeah it's just well it's impressive no <laughs> it's oh. like if the architecture have some information of the system, right? Uh, this is the, the figure you're talking about, right? Yeah, 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 yes, yes. It's not only, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's perhaps even more uh, impressive than you thought. So basically we can even use a data descriptor vector to describe your different uh, data sets and then use that to generate a, a useful architecture in one shot. So basically you can train a controller neural network and then for, in the future, when you have a new data set, we can just describe your data. And then this trend controller can generate a, a, a data specific uh, architecture for you. And if you're interested, I think you can read uh, this uh, preprint where, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we'll follow up on this, uh, on this in the future. But uh, the, right now the main limitation is because training, running, NAS on each of those individual data sets is taking a huge amount of time. So we need to move on to this training-free NAS techniques. Um, do you have an estimation of, of if, if the structure of the architecture or if the operations is more important because there are some works that say that even some randomly wired architectures can perform really well. But from some experiments that I ran, I saw that the, the top performing architectures from the INAS data set uh, had all of them uh, had the same structure but different operations. So this is maybe a hint that I don't know, maybe the operations in the end are more important if you find the correct structure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that's. Uh... I think this is definitely still a, like an open area to explore. Um, it, specifically in biology, so we care not only about this uh, like accuracy, but a lot of times also about the interpretability. And uh, in these particular cases, we I think in, in biology we already know that the motifs, which is the which is basically these guys, right? Those are the local patterns in your DNA sequences. Some can be longer than the others. And uh, their grammars also different based on different biological factors you are profiling. So I think the phenomena that uh, different neural architectures will be preferred will profile different uh, biological factors will always remain there. Also, uh... Did you encode the different operations as with one hot vectors? Yes, yes, that's uh, that's what we did, and then uh, we can like actually in our paper we can we can even analyze the, the embedding the learned embedding for different uh, operations, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. So basically, the the operations are one hot encoded, but. Uh, we will actually learn uh, embedding for those uh, almost like a word, word tokens uh, through this architecture search. And what we were able to show is that the dilated convolution, if you do a PCA for these embedding vectors, dilated convolution lies right in between pooling operations and the uh, vanilla convolutions, which is makes sense because dilated convolutions can enlarge your receptive fields just like a pooling, but it also does convolution. And uh, I think a lot of works in the NAS field has been focused on improving the uh, embedding learning. So yeah, so if you have a good embedding for your operations, you can even use a very simple like Bayesian optimization to, to do that. And, yeah.